I misquoted you in the article several times. I think people like seeing no, the answer is no. Are you sure? Okay, you don't want to go first? I mean, I'm going to have to go you know, I always like my panels to be on edge a little bit. I try to leave out with the person who needs to go first. Get them really nervous. Uh, you might blurt out something. I'm already really a little bit nervous. I'm sitting next to you, and I got to sign yeah, the first time. And then tell the next bit. But you know what you could do is, like, you have, like, a little bit of this dark back and forth. I could do that. In theory, I could do that. Yes, I hope it's that. Sure. Would you want to moderate? Hey, great you know, we can switch to <laughs> that moderating is so wrote, much easier. You brought a great article. Oh, thank you. Is it in this issue? Uh, yes, I think that's uh, but I didn't find it. Yeah, it's yeah. Just, that's just an excerpt like, like, of the, oh, the, I see, the okay. whole magazine. But well, it has the whole magazine. Yeah, okay. That's why I was looking through it and I didn't find it. Like, and it must be a different issue. Uh, no, no, it's, it's there. Um, yeah, it's funny, you know, people often ask me after an article like this comes out, they say, well, you know, that was great, I learned so much, I'd like to hear more about it. And I'm like, anything I do, I do the article. I'm done. I don't know anything beyond it. It's the sum of my knowledge. The only thing that I could put in the article, which I would like to, are the citations to the actual paper. Oh, yes, yeah. Because if people want to learn more, they can just go and I know, get the, I know. And read the academic papers, which I don't think a lot of people do. Oh, no, I always go for the academic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. But go to read news I mean, exactly. Yeah, that's, but I agree with you. I think the more the New York Times, I think, cites the uh, academic papers when it helps them. Yes. In the opinion yeah. pieces that seem like the academic. You no, know, the problem with that is.
Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, and, and welcome to Georgia Tech for those of you joining us from uh, outside. So, uh, the theme of this uh, of this uh, meeting is uh, the impact uh, of, of drivers' cars or cars vehicles on on society and on people. And uh, I thought I'll, I'll uh, share with you a couple of things about my own experience with that, as well as some of the other uh, areas that I've been, I've been uh, looking at in this area. So, uh, so I have I have uh, twin boys. Uh, they go to Georgia Tech. Uh, one of them uh, could not wait until he got his first his driver's license, and, and you know when he was 16, he got his driver's license. He drives and and uh, and uh, is uh, is pretty happy with that. His brother, twin, eight hours difference. Uh, I mean, eight minutes. I'm sorry, his mother <laughs> Eight minutes. Uh, decided that he doesn't need to drive. In fact, he's got he's got to drive with his brother. <laughs> he's got other times when he needs to go someplace, it's either Uber or, or some other editor, or mom or dad or something else. So so it already, you know, from my sample, fifty percent of the people are you know not driving. So uh, the other the other uh, the other uh, uh, story I want to share with you is, is I have a brother who is uh, who is in New York and, and most recently he got uh, uh, he got a Tesla and uh, you know, he's very happy with the car and everything, but, but his most favorite thing about it is the summon feature. Anybody knows what the summon feature is? Yeah. So he stands someplace and he summons the car. Right? Right? So, so this is, this is, this is uh, you know, some of, some of the new things or some of the areas that we didn't know we need actually, or some of the features we didn't know we need now, now we're all, we're all uh, getting used to it. But, but really, those are the, the, the fun or the, the, uh, the light. Uh, impacts. I think the biggest impact, uh, from what uh, from what I read and understood, is that uh, actually driving is the largest single uh, occupation of males, especially those who, who don't have college or you know, education at all. You know, we see that. You know, when people immigrate, when people go from one country to the other, you know, a lot of them, you know, they can drive. You know, they can, they can function uh, and do do well. And and uh, you know, if you count truck driving, you count all kinds of driving taxis and. So that's the largest single uh, occupation of males in the world. So now, fast forward to a time where you don't need that many or fewer of them. And just the, the social, economic, the social impact of that is, is something that, that people are beginning to grapple with. So um, at Georgia Tech, of course, we are with the Georgia Institute of Technology. We do a lot of research in engineering and sciences and technology and so on. But we're also we have uh, also uh, folks who are studying uh, issues related to policy, to uh, social impact, and, and others. And, and uh, uh, this is really um, this is really the, the theme, or, or one of the things that I think uh, we fail sometimes to uh, to look at the secondary effect of the new technology. We accept social media, and social networks, as, as beneficial until someone turns them against us. And I think one of the issues that we have very careful about is to look at the other, at the impact, the non-technological impact of, of technologies. And, and I, I can think of no one better to be uh, participating in leading this conversation than the folks at Georgia Tech and, and our colleagues from this week. So thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate you being here. Enjoy, enjoy your day. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Welcome to heaven and uh, welcome to our uh, viewers online as well. And thank you uh, in advance to our panelists. And I'll introduce them in a second. Um, but let me just say that the name of this panel is the promise of driverless cars. I think we all can imagine that driverless cars could have a huge impact on our futures, potentially. And so uh, the idea of this panel is to take a look at some of the far reaching ways uh, as well as some of the possibly immediate ways that uh, these vehicles could have potentially a beneficial effect on society. What, what might the goals here be? Um, and uh, first of all, let me ask is, you can all hear me okay? Sorry, Great. David, can you, just for our, our online audience, can you guys hold the mic? Because that's the only way they, the online audience can hear you. Oh, so when we're talking, you want us to hold the mic? Okay. So they can hear without me holding right. the mic? Okay. No, you're fine. Good. Let me know if that changes. Uh, so let me introduce our panel. Uh, first, uh, uh, Deborah Lamb. Uh, Deborah is the Managing Director of Smart Cities and Inclusive Innovation for Georgia Tech. It's a newly created role to drive smart cities and urban innovation work across the university and beyond. Prior to this role, she served as Pittsburgh's first ever Chief of Innovation and Performance, where she oversaw all technology, sustainability, performance, and innovation functions of city government. Uh, Subro Guhathakarta, professor and chair uh, of the School of City and Regional Planning. Uh, he joined Georgia Tech in 2011 as director of the Center for Geographic Information Systems, uh, and he was previously associate director of the School of Geographical Sciences and urban planning in Arizona State University and among the founding faculty members of ASU's School of Sustainability. Um, Chris Carter, who is co-chair of the Boston Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. He is a non-practicing engineer, an optimistic urban planner, and a self-taught filmmaker. Chris has helped lead Boston's overhaul of parking technology expanded the city's mobility options, launched a digital storytelling unit, managed the award-winning public space Invitational, and currently oversees the city's autonomous vehicle research efforts. Uh, Mark De La Vernia is the chief, mobility, uh, chief of mobility innovation for the city of Detroit. Prior to this role, uh, he led the national transportation planning practice at Sam Schwartz Consulting, where he worked with cities across the country on complex mobility issues. And not here today, to my left, is uh, Taggart Mathiasen, head of product at uh, Lyft, uh, who pulled out from the conference. Um, I'm going to turn things over to our panelists in a second. Uh, let me just mention, though, that uh, because we want to have plenty of time for discussion, for your questions, both from you here and those listening online. Um, we're going to keep the opening remarks of our panelists very, very short. So forgive me in advance, panelists, if I uh, pressure you to wrap things up within five minutes each. Uh, so uh, yeah, Mark, would you mind starting off uh, today? Sure. So uh, I was going to go last because it would be much easier that way. Yeah, uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I was late to the prep phone call, so that, that should teach all of us on that. Um, yeah, so mobility in Detroit, like no, many other American cities, you know, can be a struggle for a lot of folks. Um, and, you know, we have some very unique conditions in the city, um, particularly the way our, our auto insurance is made. So um, just getting places can be can be tough for folks. Um, and so we're doing a lot with regards to traditional methods of transit, improving our traffic conditions, adding bike lanes. Um, but the mayor started this office seeing that um, the future is coming um, and we need to figure out um, not just how we like take vendor meetings and just be like, that's great, but understand like how these, some of these solutions can build upon what we are doing and actually solve problems for the people in Detroit. Um, obviously Detroit, is very vested in the future of mobility. Um, you know, the, the biggest announcement that we've had um, over the last year was that Ford is moving their, their autonomous and electric team into the city um, in uh, the old train station, which was kind of the symbol of Detroit's decline, um, which is pretty an amazing experience. So obviously we're, 
we're very interested in um, how we can partner with these companies as well and, and learn together on this new types of technology. Um, we do have an autonomous shuttle running right now. Um, it's uh, it runs in downtown. It serves um, uh, Quicken Loans, their family of companies, which is the, the largest employer of Detroit. I mean, it's fine. It's it's just a shuttle. Uh, it has a safety driver there. It's probably the safest vehicle in downtown Detroit. So it's uh, <laughs> it's a nice one to ride your scooter next to and feel comfortable. Um, and I, you know what what we're trying to do right now, and I think we'll probably get into this a lot more, is um, transportation is a very individualized experience like you know everyone here probably can sort of see like how autonomous vehicles would, would impact them um but to really be able to understand like what are people what are people's challenges out there today like we need to be out there like talking with people not just sort of putting technology on them but really being able to say like what are what are the, the challenges and issues and problem statements that, that our residents are facing and then what are the ways that technology can hopefully address some of those frictions um you know, it's 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 a lot of design thinking type stuff, but really being able to to have our residents be part of the ideation and prototyping as we start to think about new types of services and technology. Thank you, Chris. So, uh, like Detroit, we have lots of uh, similar challenges, some different ones. Uh, the work that started in Boston a few years ago around planning uh, sort of kicked off our interest in autonomous vehicles. So. Uh, there, there's sort of three things that um, that were sort of the bedrock for the city launching a comprehensive uh, planning process, both in transportation but for the city at large. One is sort of increasing challenges around climate change. Uh, the winter of 2015 in Boston essentially crippled our transportation system. We had four consecutive blizzards in the month of February. People were uh, left on train platforms, left walking to work, left sort of uh, isolated uh, and not being able to get anywhere. That was sort of one big piece of it. We've seen that sort of continue with flooding and other things. We are a coastal city. We know the world is changing. We need to figure out solutions to be able to still move people around in that environment. The next was around growth. We are going through the biggest period of growth. This is not a common the most major metros right now, uh, but biggest period of growth since the 1950s. So we're closing in on about 730,000 people by 2030. Uh, and guess what? We're not living in eight or 10 or 12 person families anymore. Uh, like we were back when we used to have this population in the early 1900s in Boston. So how do we make sure that we are accommodating that growth, making sure that we're managing uh, the city in a responsible way, knowing that we're not going to expand the right of way uh, in the city of Boston. We're not going to tear down buildings to build highways. Uh, we may spend a lot of your money to put them underground, but uh, we're not going to build them. Uh, and then lastly, inequality. And this is also facing this country uh, and it's maybe the biggest challenge that we have. Uh, a couple of years ago, Brookings Institute ranked Boston first in something you never want to be first in, is the most uh, inequitable city in the country. The gap between our high income earners at the 90th percentile and the low at the 20th percentile was the biggest of anywhere. We have, we have since sort of gone down to seventh, but that's still arguably not a place you want to be. Uh, and it is something that we are sort of trying to figure out how every single policy we do addresses that challenge. Uh, in the city of Boston. So that led to um, our transportation planning process, sort of that foundation. Uh, and we went out and we talked to thousands and thousands of Bostonians about transportation in the city of Boston. And they came back with questions about hoverboards and flying cars and autonomous vehicles, but also really simple questions about uh, pedestrian uh, signal actualization at crosswalks and how come they couldn't have this in their neighborhoods and uh, sort of how we're prioritizing different modes of travel. It came down to sort of three goals for people, safety, access and reliability. How do we make our streets safer? How do we make our transportation system more accessible? And how do we make sure that getting around Boston is more reliable and dependent? And so we looked at that and said, great, there's gonna be like uh, 58 projects that we're gonna to do to address that is what we came out of the plan. And one of those is autonomous mobility and policy around that. We sort of had an executive order from the mayor, from the governor that sort of allowed us to sort of begin testing research. But more so, it's about how do we start engaging with the public on this topic so we develop these technologies in a way that meets those goals about making our streets safer, about making the transportation system more accessible and reliable. And how do we put uh, humans at the center of that um, in a way that doesn't mean that we just sort of do the status quo. So I think the real challenge that we're sort of facing is that if we just swap out personal 
single occupancy vehicles for now autonomous vehicles or grow that, uh, we are uh, in for a world of hurt in our city and probably everywhere else in the country that we can't sort of stomach that. So we need to think about sharing these vehicles, think about using them for public transit in new ways, uh, and thinking about how we sort of make sure that space that we are reclaiming, hopefully from parking, uh, that we don't need, is then reallocated to more active transportation uses and public transit. Um, that is the work that is in front of us. We are sort of at the tip of the iceberg at this point, um, but really excited to be here today to talk about all the good things uh, that we can sort of be optimistic about. Thank you. Super. Right. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to see so many of you here, and thanks to Newsweek for putting this event together. So, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the academic uh, research questions that we have been asking, and uh, most of the work I'm going to talk about is done with my former PhD student, Wen Wen Chang, who is at Virginia Tech right now, so I should acknowledge her. And we were looking specifically at the question of how shared autonomous vehicles, not the privately owned autonomous vehicles, but the shared autonomous vehicles, which we believe are going to be the early introduction of autonomous uh, technologies, are going to change the urban fabric. And asking questions such as, what will happen to parking? Where will parking be located? Where will people choose to live if they are using shared autonomous vehicles mostly? Where would businesses find locations if their employees are mostly using shared autonomous vehicles and they're using uh, autonomous freight uh, vehicles for their uh, logistics? So these are some of the questions that we have been asking. And we've got some very interesting answers because we also looked at a lot of data because we used Atlanta as our test bed city. We collected a lot of data about it our existing uh, transportation patterns, our existing location choices that people are making. And then we inserted a simulation model of shared autonomous vehicles. We assumed that there would be, let's say, a 5% penetration of shared autonomous vehicle mobility. So with just 5% of all transportation, all trips being with this shared mode, what would happen to people's choices of where they would live, where businesses would locate, what parking, uh, where parking would be located. So what did we find? We found that 90% and above of the parking spots will become not necessary. That is, they, those will be emancipated. So a lot of parking spaces will now become available for other kinds of purposes. So you can think what you can do with all the on-street parking. And uh, that becomes a planning issue. That is, we need to deliberately think about what to do with those uh, parking spots that would no longer be needed. And there are lots of possibilities that we've thought about. You know, affordable housing units, uh, bike lanes along the roads where you pre previously had uh, parking spots, uh, bigger pedestrian ways we feel that people with would choose more active modes of transportation if they are mostly using autonomous vehicles uh, in uh, other commute uh, patterns for longer distance patterns. Uh, in terms of housing location choice, we found a diversity of, uh, of choices based upon the type of household. So households with kids would move slightly away from the core of the city Households that are older will probably move slightly towards the core of the city. So all this conversation about are we going to suburbanize more, uh, we didn't really find an excessive rates of suburbanization in our models. We found that there would be some scrambling of locations, but uh, there, there is a demand for people to move closer to the city centers because if you're using shared autonomous vehicles, what will matter is how long you have to wait for being picked up by these vehicles. And those waits are going to be shorter in the core areas, the denser areas of town than in the outskirts of the city. In terms of businesses, we didn't really find too much changes except that uh, 
businesses that need a lot of physical movements will move further out to use the autonomous freight deliveries and uh, the administrative uh, as well as the public services will move closer in. So these kinds of changes we were finding, none of the changes seem to suggest to us that there are dire consequences of autonomous vehicles. Most of these were benign or actually would make our cities more livable if we plan it well. So the important aspect is how we plan, how we actually look into this future and make sure that we take advantage of the opportunities and avoid some of the pitfalls. Thank you. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I'm welcome again to Atlanta and Georgia Tech. Uh, I also share a, a more optimistic view of, of AVs um, with the caveats, but I also think that you know the scenarios that we've created in terms of the the future of all AVs and what we have now is is a little bit misleading because there will be a period of time of coexistence, um, meaning that there will be human drivers with autonomous drivers um, or vehicles um, uh, driving and, and coinciding side by side. Um, and so the, the bigger question for me is, you know, what is that period of interaction and that engagement? And, um, you know, this is where I shift from, from my role in the city to a, a role in a university and the education that's required. So as, as much as it, it's important that you see it maybe a decline in, in driver's licenses, as, as noted earlier, I actually think we should strengthen um, driver's um, license education. Um, you know, what can be done um, when you are driving and, you know, you have an interaction with an autonomous vehicle? What, what is the, the guidelines or the protocols? What happens when and if you get into a, that crash? Um, and even if you aren't driving, um, or don't necessarily have a driver's license, you're not necessarily opting out of that responsibility. Um, because as a pedestrian, as a citizen, you are um, engaged in a mixed modal um, multi-use transportation. So, you know, when you're a pedestrian and you see an autonomous vehicle, what is that interaction and that engagement? And, you know, what is that guideline to ensure that you are protected as, as well as your, your, your fellow um, pedestrians on the street. So I, I do think, um, and I, I mentioned this briefly in, in the article, that there should be um, an increased role in driver's ed um, in uh, autonomous vehicles, but also even if you don't have um, a driver's ed to really think about education as a whole um, for the citizen um, in this autonomous um, vehicle world. Thank you. And, uh, and now, actually, we're, we're going to open it up to questions uh, from the audience here and also uh, from uh, our listeners online. Um, does anybody want to start off with a question? We, we have several here. Let's see, we have a microphone ready. Um, how about uh, this person right here? I need a microphone. I don't think here? so. Oh, you don't? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought mics would go there. Okay. I don't know. I'm a process engineer. Um, I look at, at current state of cars in the United States. The United States. If you look at the top 20 reasons why people, why 40,000 people a year die, several hundred thousand are permanently aired in some way, and several million are injured, so they take time to recover. I look at those behaviors, um, the top change, distracted driving, more popular than ever. Um, drunk driving is number two in terms of all those reasons. Speeding, apparently in Germany, the, the non self driving people with taunting the cars. I believe that would happen here. Um, reckless road racing, bad weather, is five or six. Running red light, making mistakes. I look at all those behaviors in autonomous vehicles, at least in as much as I could the last couple of weeks. Um, it's, it's really going to be like aircraft today. Pilot and co pilot taxi out to the end of the runway and press Boston. And then the plane goes to Logan Airport and on final approach, it is at the end of the runway, it says manual takeover required. And the question is so, what do they do for a living? And the answer is their insurance. But having two or three people up there 
if several hundred people die, it's going to be a bad thing for insurance costs. So I see the revolution in very enlightening comments, and <clears throat> the number of cars will plummet um, because they'll be operating 24-7 and all that good stuff. But to me, there's this tremendous bunch of people, trial lawyers, emergency rooms, liquor stores, I don't know what, that really won't want this to go away. They make their living of disasters and, and the errors people make tow trucks, collision repair places, there's one every corner and every tire places. A lot of well, is, is that your question then, sort of what happens to the, some of these people who are displaced by the problems of current day cars and drivers? Yeah. Well, so we do have a panel coming up on the hell of, of drugs, so I don't want to steal their thunder. But, but let me just say, is, is there perhaps a more optimistic answer? Because I think a lot of people are worried about job loss in the uh, autonomous economy. Someone want to tackle possibly why that might not be as big a problem as we fear? Uh, you know, I serve for a mayor that comes from a labor background. That is certainly his primary concern when we talk about new technologies and automation. Uh, as how we are thinking about what it's going to do for people. I think the, the thing that's maybe interesting for me is that we've got all these people working jobs uh, driving that you know are relatively low skill, not all of them, some of them. What if we can repurpose those still in the transportation sector? What kind of thing can we get done there, right? Like what if, uh, and this is often cited, but a bus driver on the MBTA bus service in Boston, like 10% of the job is driving that bus. The other 90% is like, Helping people, uh, you know, managing disputes that are going on, helping people do fair payments, like giving people directions, advice, consultation on their lives. Um, now, what if we sort of say, well, that is your job, right? You are on this bus uh, and you are a sort of liaison for the city. You're helping people connect to services. You're helping people sort of find their way around. You're making suggestions. You are the concierge for Boston. That's really pretty interesting. So I think. The, the challenge is, is that people maybe are looking at automation and autonomous vehicles uh, as a way to uh, get rid of the bus driver. And I think that's not the reality. I think it's repurposing some of these roles that exist in transportation, um, whether that's in fleet management or um, or sort of in, in these sort of social services that we don't currently do well that we could do. Great. Uh, another question. Let's see. We, uh, yeah, I think uh, you had your hand up. I'm actually going to give you the microphone just to make it clear. Okay. I'm Dan Moore. Thank you for coming to the panel. I actually know how to ask the question, so I'm going to ask it. True or false? <laughs> Tony Savas says car ownership is going to go from $10,000 a year to transportation and the service for at $1,000 a year. True or false? Each panel, please. <laughs> yes. <laughs> True. I reject the premise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I agree. No. Well, from from my research, the cost of shared autonomous vehicles will might even come down to from thirteen cents to twenty cents a mile, which is something below any transportation system in this country has seen. So at that cost level. It is quite likely that you know you, your transportation uh, annual transportation costs could see a dramatic decline. I, I'm just going to reject that premise on a, on a couple reasons. Is one of the things that is currently plaguing our our uh, current transportation system is that it doesn't account for the environmental externalities. Um, especially when it comes to carbon emissions, especially when it comes to the damage to the environment, right? That it's, it's a real cost um, when it comes to economic development and, and obviously what, what's going on at the international level. Um, and so when you do shift into a cleaner um, transportation mode, I think there is an added bad advantage that's not accounted for in a traditional business model. Um, and, and this is why in general we are um, touted for shared um, autonomous vehicle shuttles, um, you know, shared um, kind of mobility services um, that, you know, is different than a single occupancy vehicle that's dependent on gasoline. And there's a, there's a public policy component of this. So 
that pricing changes depending on if levers are pulled at cities and states or federal levels on EMT and other things, right? Uh, to make sure that those negative externalities are, are, are sort of encompassing that price, right? If we just sort of drop the cost of driving across the board or in mass services, does that make fewer people ride bikes, walk, take transit? Um, and that's not a good outcome for, at least for our city at large, right? To have more people moving around in smaller pockets. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I'll agree with the point, but I mean, I, I think it's more along, and I'm glad I appreciate the search how all the work has been done that day. Like, um, we just don't, like, people that are going to be, like, this. We don't know who they are. Like, my daughter's four. I don't know what she's going to want to do in 10 years, like, and how she's going to want to treat this. Like, 10 years ago, like, I thought it was crazy for my staff to get a roommate on Craigslist, right? Because that was just the same thing, and that's that's changed, and that's just sort of created. Like, I look at my, the toys that my daughter gets now are just, like, poop emoji. Like, this is a completely different world of, like, people are, are just sort of changing behavior. So, like, how, how is this all going to play out is really going to be Obviously, going to be dependent on the policy standpoint, but how how people you just sitting in a vehicle with somebody else is, is something we just don't don't know because a lot of those people aren't even. Well, we have some idea because we see what the shared uh, Ubers and Lyfts are are attracting. And, For people that are twenty two now, but people that are five and, and their demand is uh, exponentially growing which is uh, growing faster than the, the single, uh, you know, uh, single passenger Ubers and Lyfts. So. Yeah. so the question of shared versus single uh, uh, person vehicle is critical to the whole future of this. Is, is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah, yes, that's, yes. absolutely. Um, great question. Yeah, we had somebody over here with a question. Uh, let's see. Okay, back there. Microphone's coming. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about the research on uh, how the appearance of autonomous shared autonomous vehicles will affect where people will be and so on. So the, the things that you found seemed very uh, sounds sounded similar to what would happen with an improved public transportation system. So what are, what are the differences between uh, the effects of a good public transportation system versus uh, appearance of shared autonomous systems? That's an excellent question. And uh, what, what, you're, uh, what you're asking is, if we improve the transportation system, would we see similar kinds of behavior? And uh, there are multiple ways of viewing the current transportation system. We know that uh, people perceive the different modes of transportation differently. So, so if you have a high-speed transit system, a subway system, people might prefer that. But if you provide buses, for some reason, they might find buses to have some sort of a you know, negative uh, association with that uh, in terms of their perception. So how they perceive the uh, shared autonomous vehicles is very critical to understanding how they would make those choices. So I don't think that it is going to be exactly the same as expanding the transportation system that, that we have, because the perception of the shared autonomous vehicles are going to be very different from our existing transportation system. We actually have a question from from our online audience. If I can, if I can ask that, um, we'll start with this one. Maybe I'm old school, but no way I would trust a driverless car. It seems we're getting a little bit of this from our webinar audience. How do you deal with that general public distrust from people who are just really skeptical of this technology? Um, that's a thing, right? Like, I mean, I think it's a thing in Detroit right now. We'll be talking to see how some people don't, don't trust with cell different folks that sort of um, aren't familiar with that technology. You know, credit card keys where they say, like, I'm going to call a cab if you don't to um, do something like this. Um, 
the way that we're going to approach it, and I think you guys have done the same thing, is to just go talk to them, right? Um, basically say, like, here's here's an autonomous vehicle. We think, you know, how, how would you use this? You know, what are your fears? So we can communicate that back to the companies. Um, because to be honest, like, this is, we have lots of problems to solve, but solving that problem is not our, our number one issue. Um, and this is kind of where there needs to be sort of this public-private partnership together, um, learning that's needed on, on both sides. Um, and, you know, and companies are doing focus groups and, and doing all these things, but just sort of getting over the trust is going to be a, a huge barrier. I totally agree. I, I think back maybe 10 years, and if you had told me <clears throat> I could put my personal vehicle up and share it with the community, I would have said, I don't really want to do that. And now there's companies that like that. If I that I was going to go to Atlanta and stay in somebody's house that I've never met before. Uh, you would say that's really crazy and dangerous, and now people do that on Airbnb every day. Uh, I think there, there's sort of this sort of social acceptance that comes with time and exposure to things. So the approach we've been taking in Boston, that is one of the reasons why we're doing test and test is to allow the public to interact and engage with this technology, to ask questions to the people that are developing it, um, and to become more comfortable with it. We've done that in a few different ways, whether that's sort of focus groups, the sort of traditional, you know, people on different sides of glass, and you sort of ask questions and, and try to sort of discern where people's thoughts are, uh, to the more sort of tactical, we host a, a autonomous vehicle petting zoo. Uh, every October on City Hall Plaza, we bring out all the vehicles uh, and engineers, and we allow the public to come through and sort of ask questions and, um, and play sort of different games around AI and morality and all those things. Um, we have found that to be an effective way to sort of at least understand what the concerns are and sort of help build the questions that we need to answer through research. And then more recently, through the public private partnership piece, the companies that are testing in Boston, uh, there's a couple things. They, as their passenger pilots that they do when they carry passengers, which they can't do uh, for fees right now, but they are allowed to sort of carry, 15% of those passengers have to be a senior or uh, somebody with a mobility or vision impairment um, so that we're developing this technology in a way that is addressing those populations and so that those people get an opportunity to sort of inform that. Uh, and then we are also doing sort of these learning delegations to those companies where we bring a group of sort of neighborhood council members or transportation advocacy groups to uh, a company. We allow them to sort of talk about their technology and then we go and do some test drives so they have a better understanding of what that actually looks like on the ground now. And this really grew out of uh, the, the crash that happened in Arizona with Uber that a number of people raised their hands in, in our city and said, why are we taking this risk? And we don't understand what this risk looks like. So we've been trying to sort of bridge that gap to understand what testing it looks like, but also sort of get towards better adoption. Yeah, and let me, let me add with very much agree with what Mark and, and Chris said. And, and actually, that question is not um, new. In fact, Pew studies show that a majority of Americans actually are afraid or, or had a, if they had a choice, would choose not to use an autonomous vehicle right now. But that's shifting. And if you start slicing it by the demographics that we talked about, it's, it's obviously very different. But the big point for that, for me, is choice. Right, so it's it's those that if they had a choice, they would prefer their own single occupancy vehicle and prefer to drive it themselves. But in terms of what autonomous vehicle promises to do, which is address some of the inequality and accessibility issues, especially when it comes to first mile, last mile, especially when it comes to public transportation that doesn't get out to some of those neighborhoods in a consistent quality um, schedule, then autonomous vehicles offer uh, an option for those that do need to commute and are mobile. And so I think that's uh, a shift that we need to understand as part of that socialization part. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the socialization um, program needs to happen at a wider um, citizen level, but we do need to understand that I see autonomous vehicles as something to address some of the wider mobility inequalities. Um, and it's a tool in the broader um, public transportation, transportation toolkit that should interact with the different modes of transportation that currently exist within the city. And I would even say that addresses the first question um, that, you know, given the, the difficulties with, um, 
you know, human error and, and, and other conditions, in some cases, autonomous vehicles are safer. So, you know, most of the studies show that autonomous vehicles can address about 94% of crashes that are addressed by human error, right? The other percentage is by road conditions and weather that, you know, can't be accounted for human error. So if you take out that 94% of fatalities, which is right now 38,000 this year, so that's, that's actually a 7% increase from last year. So we are actually increasing the number of, of road deaths that are happening in the US. If you can address 94% or even 90% of it um, because you take out that human error component, then, then that's a substantial um, shift in, in the quality of life um, on multiple levels. Thank you. Uh, so we had, a, we had a question back here. Which, which states or cities do you see as being the most forward thinking to autonomous vehicles? And why is that? So, which states or cities are most forward thinking in this? Detroit. Matter? Uh, Boston and Detroit. Right. Um, you know, so in, in Detroit, Michigan the state preempts us on on time to so we can actually um, and the state has done this to support the testing. Um so, you know, from that point of view, you know, if you sort of look at it from a set of testing standpoint, uh, Michigan was forward thinking. Um, but then you look at a, a city like Los Angeles, um, who's, you know, doing a lot on the, the data standpoint um, to say, how do we start to use data for active management? You know, scooters is their initial data set, but thinking through how this is going to play out towards autonomous vehicles, that's forward thinking on the, on the policy side. Um, what we're trying to do is just sort of like begin to get our foundations correct, right? Like beginning to say like how do we get our data house in order? Beginning to say like how do we start to like build a new group that starts to look at the curve itself and how it's going to change and get those people to that. Um, so we come to like scooters where it was just like how do we react to something really new? Um, and how do we deal with not just sort of them being out there and sort of the regulatory standpoint, but pushback that we get from somebody out there how we come manage that as well. So um, you know there's there's that would be there's different scales of, of how you get to, to look at it and that's we're just trying to like get ourselves prepared and baby steps. Maybe only two things to add. I think there's a question whether uh, federal legislation preempts any cities and states from being able to do really good work on this. Um, and then there is a wide disparity on sort of what's happening and who's tackling what. I would add in that, uh, like scooters, uh, ride hailing TNC services are sort of the canary here, right? So if we're imagining these this technology rolling out and sort of shared ride hailing platforms potentially, one of the early things that happens, cities that have been doing really good work on that uh, are positioning themselves a way to be able to address this too. So I look at what LA has been doing on data, but I also look at what New York has set up from a regulatory standpoint for the Taxi Limousine Commission mm -hmm. that has given them a really great tool to be able to smartly regulate the amount of vehicles and how they're used and uh, fair wages and all sorts of things. And let me just add, when, when we were planning this event, we did think which cities we wanted to bring down to talk about this in. And we did count, you know, Boston and Detroit among the leaders in that. And, and I would... I would add a, a couple reasons for this um, and, and talk about the, the broad canary um, issue, which is there, there are states and, and cities that have no laws or regulations. So it's kind of like a no man's land, wild, wild, wild west. Nothing, nothing is happening in terms of that kind of um, regulation. And then there are cities and states that just ban it, right? They, they don't understand it. They need time. They, they just outright, you know, aren't, aren't a welcoming environment. And I think the best um, city uh, universe or city states are the ones in the middle that are, you know, actively seeking partnerships, trying to understand, put in investments in, and, and trying to use this as a tool to address some of the challenges that they face 
and mobility. And you see that in, in of course, my hometown, Pittsburgh, that, that's doing some great stuff. You see it in Ohio, um, obviously, when uh, it won the USDOT Smart City Challenge. Obviously, Arizona has been a very welcoming environment in this space. So it, it's that kind of middle where you're able to take innovation and risk, but obviously push it towards a greater goal of addressing mobility for, for your citizens. And I didn't mention this, but I should, because Mark mentioned sort of Detroit not having say. In Massachusetts, actually, the state allows a municipality, actually, the municipality drives the process. Um, so it's a, a very much a collaborative effort between the state DOT and whatever municipality that testing is happening in. It looks different than almost anywhere else in the country, the way that rolls out. And that was a, a recognition from MassDOT that uh, what happens for mobility in Boston is different than what we need in the Berkshires and the challenges we're trying to solve is different. So therefore, what we might want to actually test is different and cities should uh, should be able to sort of uh, drive that uh, however they see fit. I think it was also a clever way for uh, for the governor to share and blame if something bad happened, but um, so far so good. Do you, do you have intercity agreements for intercity transportation? Is that how that works or do you have to stay within Boston? Uh, so we, we started just in Boston um, and then over the last year sort of negotiated what that would look like at a, at least sort of the metro Boston area. So there's 14 cities and towns around Boston that now have the ability to test, have put together pieces of their testing plans, um, 14 cities and towns plus Worcester, which is sort of in the middle of mm. uh, as a way for companies to be able, if they should choose, to want to do multiple things. We also do a graduated testing plan, which gets at sort of the earlier question about how do you make people feel comfortable with technology. Um, so the way Boston and the way Massachusetts has done it is that you put together these sort of bound areas first, companies test there as they sort of prove the technology that can grow both in geography, but also in their operational design domain. Mm -hmm. So more complex streets, uh, different times of day, different weather conditions. Um, as a way to both say, this is sort of like a junior driver's license for AVs, right? You've got to be able to drive here first before you can go to this place. Um, so each of those cities and towns is putting together what that package of roads, uh, that network looks like there, and then uh, how they sort of stitch together. So just was one other point going back to the question is uh, when you talk about which cities or states are making progress, you have to separate out the states and cities that are making a lot of progress in terms of planning, policy, regulations versus others that j just want the technology. And if you, if you look at Arizona, they already have way more running. And uh, they all had Uber uh, with their driverless cars much earlier. If you look at their legislation, it is a lot thinner document than what you'll see in, in California, what you'll see in New York is different pace in terms of regulation, policy, versus just adopting and trying to be the first movers in the technology. Thank you. I think we've got a question back here. So I want to return to the equity problem that you mentioned. So one of the things happening in Atlanta is that we are rapidly moving a lot of our kind of more, our poorer population out to our suburbs as people move towards the city. We are displacing a lot of people out to our suburbs. So Uber, for example, financial model doesn't work very well in suburbs because of the disconnected nature of the dendritic road network in the suburbs. So people start getting spread out all over the place. How do we kind of equitably distribute autonomy in a way that it works, at least in theory, very well in places like downtowns, midtown, things like that? How do we make it work for people as we kind of displace an already marginalized population? And then if we start to implement DMT taxes um, on these miles traveled, not disproportionately shift the cost of autonomy onto an already marginalized population? By careful planning. And, and that's what I, I emphasize in all the papers that I've written and, and in the article that I wrote for Newsweek. Planning is the key. There's a lot of opportunity to make sure that the equity issues are considered and addressed. Because if you have the potential of converting many of these parking, open parking spots, and you know how much parking is there in the city itself, it provides us enormous opportunity to create affordable housing, 
to create spaces for people who can access uh, uh, these shared autonomous vehicles more quickly and use them efficiently to go to their places of work. So it's how we actually design these spaces that are now made available, which will be the key to addressing how this equity issue is addressed. Um, I mean, I, I guess part of it is the fact you can't look at, you know, we're supposed to be doing positive things, but that autonomous vehicles aren't the silver bullet to solving all of our, of our issues, right? Like autonomous vehicles don't, don't change the fact that right now, 70% of our residents work outside of the city, right? Like that's just not a thing. So, um, you know, I, I think that this, when, when we sort of, and I agree on the careful planning part, um, and as you know, this becomes into more focus, like if this is really going to become a thing, like it needs to be, be a part of city policy. No different than, again, like I keep going to scooters, but the scooters is a real thing that is affecting cities right now. Um, that, you know, we, and I'm sure Boston's about to enter this conversation, and many other cities have said, like, that's great, you can drop a bunch of scooters in downtown, but this can also solve mobility challenges for other folks. And we're going to regulate you to say, like, you need to begin to to, to make this work. And thinking through those issues and, and, you know, because it's it's not the market ready solution, right? The market ready solution is drop our density is to make that happen. Um, and that's going to be the, the role of the government, and that's where we're going to need a lot of support from academics to sort of help help fuel these conversations um, to make sure that this is a solution that works for everyone. I'll add one piece in <clears throat> on the end, sort of a, uh, the emphasis, and, and I think, you know, Massachusetts does not do that, but if we did have that direction, I don't think all vehicle miles traveled are the same. Um, and so what we have sort of been talking about uh, particularly around BMTs with TNCs, let's throw many acronyms, <laughs> um, is that, you know, congested miles are worse. Miles where you are the only occupant in that vehicle are worse. Um, but as you get sort of further out into the suburbs, into the exurbs, into rural areas, you know, those miles don't actually mean the same thing, right? So there's a way to sort of structure some of maybe those fines or, or fees uh, that are trying to sort of get you to the policy outcome uh, and the public benefit that you want in a way that doesn't necessarily always disproportionately impact low income. I tend to agree. Uh, I love that you gave urban planning as a solution as an urban planning professor. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> of course, it is. It is. Of course. How could you not? Uh, but land use and planning it is are true. inextricably linked. You know, if I asked the mayor what our biggest challenge is today in Boston, you wouldn't say autonomous vehicles, you would say housing. Uh, because we need to be able to build more units and committed to doing that, but we need to make sure that they are affordable to people that are low income, but also the middle income, which is increasingly shrinking, at least in our city. Um, and how do we make sure that we make sure that people are not displaced, but we're also adding to uh, the neighbors in Boston for middle income people. The biggest challenge we have in the next sort of 10 years. And, and let me just add, I, I really think industry needs to step up a little bit more too. I mean, I've talked a little bit about the, the power of the public-private partnerships, but you know, this is where there is um, a, a, an ability of local government with universities to come together with industry to find solutions or try to address this bigger challenge because there is no silver bullet. So, you know, the, the other challenge I would, I would raise as well is, you know, not everyone has access to a credit card. Right. So if you're dependent on, you know, get in your app or smartphone. Right. So smartphone access right now is about 70 percent of Americans. Um, you know, 95 percent of Americans have have a cell phone of some kind. But 70 percent um, for 77 percent, I think, for cell phones or smartphones. But then again, if you earn under 30,000 a year, your smartphone access drops to 64 percent. Right. So the, so what the tools that, you know, Americans have now, this is uh, more U.S. centric right now, but Americans have on credit cards and cell phones, two of the most basic ingredients for mobility right now in terms of your mobility as a service um, are, are barriers. Right. So so what can you do even if you try to tackle the housing and land use issues or some of these things? So what can industry do to kind of break down some of those barriers? So. You know, there's a program that Lime just did was is called Lime Access. So Lime's one of the e-scooters right now. So they charge a different rate for those that are below a poverty line, 
um, you know, 50% decrease. And then you actually can use cash payments instead of a credit card to, to charge for your um, uh, scooter. You know, you know, what are the different tools that forces them to allow for more um, accessibility um, and mobility options for, for those that are um, on, in the marginalized um, populations? I think we have a question from someone online. Yeah, we do. Um, one of your panelists spoke about putting humans at the center of the autonomous vehicle revolution. Did you mean humans who use vehicles to move or those who use them to make a living? And how do you address both of those groups? Who said that? I don't know. <laughs> Did I say that? Did you say that? <laughs> I think you said that. <laughs> Retraction. Uh, I, you know, I think when we talk about that, it's about uh, humans to move it, it, but it could be both, right? It, um, uh, and we kind of talked about jobs a little bit, but I think if we think optimistically, uh, which is what we're supposed to be doing here, that this is going to unlock mobility for people that currently don't feel like they have it. And how do we make sure that it happens for those, for all of those people, um, particularly people who are aging and people who have sort of mobility impairments now that uh, forces them to rely on other services or asking relatives or friends or whatever it might be that sort of doesn't give them the independence that they would like to have. So that has been a, a part of the focus in Boston that's been trying to engage with that community that often gets left out of some of these other conversations, whether it's talking uh, you know, about scooters with people of uh, vision impairments. That's, not necessarily a thing that is going to solve their transportation needs. This might be, so we should have it on the table. Is it fair to say that then there there can be a vision here, and you think potentially an attainable one, where those who have mobility now will have better mobility; those who don't have it now will get it, and and with a minimum of job displacement. It's an is optimistic it, vision. It, yeah. But yeah. Is, is it yeah. possible? Is it possible? Or I hope so. Yeah. I certainly do. Yeah. There's a lot of bumps in the way. Yeah. Do you have a question over here? Yes. Yes. Um, let's, can, we, can I get your impression on the timing of when we get there? You define what there is. Mm -hmm. Because I know we talk about today we're at zero time and really full of time. That's what this kind of discussion has been to some degree. There's a, you know, yeah. I, I love that it took us 40 minutes to get to a timeline question. <laughs> uh, the best answer I've heard is, I think, from Chris Armstrong, who says, we'll have some things in two years, and we'll have lots of things in 50 years. Uh, <laughs> really, that's pretty accurate. Um, you know, if you look at, like, adoption curves for various technologies, uh, with the yes. exception of smartphones, they're like, right? Um, but it takes a while, right? So we're, we're 20, 30 years away from having, like, people opt into this, and, and there's a whole public policy component that plays into that. At what point do cities start saying, you cannot drive your personal vehicle, um, you can't drive, uh, or states saying that, um, but we need to have adoption first. So I think, you know, uh, I listened to Robin Chase talk about this, and you'll get to as well, but those sort of fleets of autonomous vehicles hitting cities in the next few years, um, probably warm weather cities that have really flat, wide roadways. Um, with no left-hand turns, and, <laughs> and then uh, and then slowly sort of merging into other cities, and then at some point we've got personally owned autonomous vehicle. In in all our models, we have uh, mixed autonomous and conventional transportation for the foreseeable future. So um, uh, it's not going to go away anytime soon. The Adoption rates is anyone's guess because this is such a transformative technology that uh, you know no one knew that Uber would be that popular so quickly. I mean, no one had predicted that. So it's anyone's guess, but we feel that it's going to be for the foreseeable future. You'll have mixed uh, autonomous versus conventional. So a little follow up to that then is a lot of what we're talking, a lot of the discussion. The autonomous cars looks like. I haven't really been discussing um, mental change for 25 years, 30 years, we won't see you are seeing. 
changing the way they live. I mean, we are, but it's still a very small percentage of the overall population. Right. I mean, like our cities took 60 years to change from the on Correct. Which is you know, very concerning. So I don't know, just sort of no, right. And in fact, what I was talking about was only looking at 5% penetration. So 95% will still be conventional vehicles and transportation systems. Are you objecting your 5%? Yeah. The, 95%? Not, not really. Well, we're not going to get rid of 95%. No, no. Our, 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 about when I moved to Boston in 2004, uh, we didn't have any, we had 0.25 miles of bike lane on the roadway. Um, we didn't have a single bus rapid transit system in the city. Um, it was fairly hard to get a car if you didn't already own one, right? Like the, the sort of sharing services. Now, you know, whatever, 15 years later, uh, hundreds of miles of bike facilities sort of around the city uh, or sort of the metro area. Bus rapid transit system, zip car, bike sharing, maybe scooter sharing at some point. Um, I got to think that even with sort of a five or ten percent penetration rate, it's going to make the decisions people make uh, about how they are living and how they are approaching mobility very different. Mm -hmm. It's expanding choice, as Deborah was saying. It's going to expand the choice. Nothing is going to go away quickly. It'll expand our choice. And, and I would add, you know, we've been concentrated on the movement of people, right? You know, there's a whole another discussion on the movement of goods. And, and I think that has been transformational in terms of our ability to get goods in the most remote places and the number of goods and the expectation of how timely the goods come. Um, it, it's due to, you know, that rapid transformation. I want to follow that this, this conversation. Uh, in light of the recent announcement from General Motors, um, it, it's, I was at a conference back in June in DC, the automated driving systems, and they were talking about the, the levels zero to five, where five is total autonomous, and we are at 2.5 now. And at that conference, they are predicting that we will be at a four to a four and a half by 2020. And because the private sector now is driving this, um, in General Motors' announcement that they are saying by mid-decade, next decade, 2025, 80% of their vehicles sold will be electric or driverless. So that's not 40 or 50 years from now. In fact, if I can count, that's six or seven years from now. So it sounds like the private sector is accelerating when are we going to get there? If we're going to be at a level five by mid-decade, then the technology is ready to go. And the private sector, if I'm a citizen and I know I can purchase a driverless vehicle, at a level five driverless vehicle, then apparently I'm ready to go. And the system is ready to go. So in light of what General Motors just announced, and I'm sure Porsche, Mercedes, Ford are going to make a similar similar announcement in 2019, um, is it really next decade? I want to I wanna differentiate the technology itself versus the how much we're ready as in terms of policy, the built environment, et cetera. I mean, Waymo's doing level four right now, testing right now, no doubt about it. So, so the technology in itself under very pristine conditions, right, meaning the flat, you know, no left turns, like very open area is being tested. But as we all know, we are living in a very complex built environment, right? With other human drivers, unpredictable weather, change in road conditions, that technology to that placed in that kind of condition has not been fully tested. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, so, so I think there's a certain amount of, of technology that's there in, in a very perfect environment tested versus what it is, you know, being tested. And then the policy and regulatory and, and financial environment. So, you know, what kind of insurance would carry a level five, um, you know, car policy for you right now? You know, th there, there's things that aren't fully in place yet to allow even for that 
you know, individual car to be sold and work in, in a Boston or Detroit right now. Yeah, I mean, whether it's seven years, or whether it's 40 years, I mean, it's the really interesting thing about this is like, it's not a quote unquote disruption because like you're having things like this to talk about this, right? And there are lots of very smart people thinking about how all this, this can be. Um, and I mean, I think is from a city standpoint, like our role is not to put a number and say, in March of 2024, this is going to happen, and that's that's our deadline we're going to make it happen. But what we can, what we basically, our, our policy is how, how do we prepare ourselves as much as possible, prepare ourselves from um, a policy standpoint, to prepare ourselves from a regulatory standpoint, not just us, but our MPO and the state, um, to be in, in, um, you know, have the conversations with our police department, with our Department of Public Works, who are going to be interacting with these types of vehicles so that people can be ready. Um, but I, I don't talk to a lot of people, right? And lots of people in the industry have lots of different opinions also on, on what this is and how it gets rolled out. And what it is. There is not a consensus. Of that. And I, I think that that's why, like, you can't. The, you can't just basically say like we're going to just sort of throw all of our efforts on on this this technology happening at this, this specific example uh, because it's just such an overall. Yeah, so making a distinction between the readiness of the technology, which is almost here. I mean, you know, level four we know it's already running. So there is no doubt that the technology will probably be ready in five to seven years, as you are pointing out. But whether people are going to adopt the technology, there will be some early adopters and a lot of later adopters and many very late adopters. So the adoption rates are not going to make it the most dominant mode of transportation in five to 10 years. I don't think that's going to happen. If you look at the example of our, our TNCs, our uh, you know, Ubers and Lyfts, they are quite popular, but they are all in any city, any city you pick, they are less than 10% of all trips still, even though they're so popular. So the, the other thing is like running a fleet is hard. GM does like a little hard to Making money in mobility is hard. Like these these are other big problems that that's also need to, to be included, not and the technology is the, the biggest one. Um, and again, this is kind of where uh, cities can, and states can help drive to say, like, this is really what we want. These are the services that we need, um, versus just saying like, this is something that's going to going to happen to us. And we're... Julia, uh, it's just after ten thirty. I think we can through? take one more question. Okay, so this will be our last question. Um, well, we have somebody right here. So. Uh, that on the intermediary period, um, what it takes a long time to actually full automation. We end up with a lot of these um, you know, advanced driver assistance systems, low level automation out there. We already have a lot of misconceptions today about what autopilot, for instance, can do, but to a number of uh, very bad accidents and even a number of fatalities. You see the states taking an increased role in educating the public about the safety about uh, safety of some of these technology in clearer way, uh, a lot of misconceptions, and frankly, this goes for students as well. And the CDC is doing uh, a study in Austin, so uh, um, maybe. Yes, I, I said that in my opening <laughs> statement. Yes, education that we need to change. How we drive, how we interact. Um, yes. Yeah, you call the drivers at yes. autonomous <laughs> vehicles. Well, I mean, just there, there needs to be a separate line that accounts for it in terms of not only learning how to drive, but learning how to drive when there is an autonomous vehicle next to you on the road, or when you get in an accident mm -hmm. with an autonomous vehicle, or mm -hmm. even when you're a pedestrian, you know, and then walking your bike. I mean, we talk about technology. Right now, technology for an autonomous vehicle can't differentiate whether you are a bicyclist on a bike or whether you have a bike on the back of your car, right? So they just know that there's a bike and I need to stop, right? So a human driver knows, oh, the bike on the back of the car, I act normal, it's just the driver. 
versus a bicyclist that's actually next to you on the road, uh, you obviously have to be more cautious about it. You know, like it, there is that human intuition that comes with the driving that's not being fully incorporated yet in the, uh, or not being fully fixed or addressed yet in that. And then there's, there's certain driver's education um, that needs to account for the, the different levels of autonomous vehicles um, that are being played. It's changing and it's evolving. So you need to be able to address that on, on a very fundamental level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and technology will catch up because you know these are all learning systems. So if they cannot detect some object, some phenomena over time, going to get better and better. Intel. to be will determine in how people are learn about the cells will have to make what can happen so in a disclaimer in terms of you know this can happen please be aware that this is not going to solve all your problems. Uh, so the legal regime that is created around these driverless vehicles are going to be critical for making sure people are aware what their rights are and what the responsibilities of the transportation system. Yeah, I'm going to make that the last word, if that's OK. We're, we've run over time here a little bit, and people need some coffee. So uh, <laughs> time for sure. So, Thank you, Anis. Great questions. Those of you uh, listening online as well. And thank you so much to our panel. Good questions. Great questions. Good questions. I don't actually don't believe it. We didn't tell anybody before. We suspect that we might be follow up on the things that you're doing.
Do you want us in particular places? Uh, no, we're, the, for, I'm gonna, we're gonna do uh, a talk with oh, Peter Rander first for oh, okay. 10 minutes and then. So I keep my cell phone on vibrate all the time, but man, I've had my phone right up at times and it's like, I gotta remember to just like, oh, disable all messages. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yes, it's two of us for a couple of minutes. I've given it a half an hour, but we, you know, we're running late. So the, I think the mics, we don't have to speak right into the mics, but we kind of have to speak. All right, welcome mics. back, everyone, to the second part of our discussion about how driverless cars will change the world. Uh, thanks again for those of you who are joining us here at Georgia Tech and for everybody who's tuned in online. We really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, our first panel on the promise of driverless cars, or what we're calling the heaven aspect, touched on how the age of autonomous vehicles might change the world for the better. We learned a lot of interesting things here, right? We learned that if we do things right, there are actually a lot of opportunities to change the world in a more positive way. Um, we learned that 90% of parking spaces could become green spaces or used for other, other purposes. We learned that driverless cars could significantly cut road deaths if they're deployed right. Um, and now we're going to start the second part of our discussion, which will begin with a fireside chat, followed by the second part of our panel, which is kind of what we're calling the hell aspects for uh, what could go wrong. And we're hoping for an equally exciting talk here. So to start us off, I'd like to introduce Greg Guterl, Newsweek's special projects editor, and Peter Rander, the CEO of Argo AI. Fred and Peter are here to help us try to answer a very important question, which is just how intelligent are driverless cars? So I'll kick it over to you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Juliana. And I just want to thank everyone who's here, this place is uh, capacity, and all our online viewers who are watching, uh, are watching our webinar, and, and all our, our distinguished guests in Georgia Tech. Uh, I'm a special projects editor, and um, I, um, I, uh, I, I want to tell you that the, the uh, and um, uh, in New Jersey, uh, the studies that science if it can be pretty clear that New Jersey has the absolute worst drivers in the world. <laughs> and uh, I really uh, of uh, going down to Miami um, to uh, ride in a driverless car uh, as part of which was uh, part of Ford's uh, pilot program down there. And um, this was a this was a driverless car. The driver the, the driverless car actually had two occupants in the front seat, one behind the wheel. And uh, uh, but we were we were seated in the back, Julia, my colleague Julian and I, and it was very interesting because um, it made me feel, uh, you know, I had some reservations. I'm, I'm probably was probably one of those people who couldn't imagine, you know, what are you crazy? I'm not getting in a car that doesn't have a driver. But um, but this it, the, the car was so cautious, um, and it, it really made me feel safe. And and then we were we were driving, and we um, we were in. And the, uh, we were on a multi-lane road, and there wasn't really very much traffic. And we were behind someone who was trying to, and the person was, you know, was standing, sitting there with the blinker on the rules, and backed in, and came in a little too sharply, and then had to try it again, and came in a little too flatly, and then had to try it again, and and after three or four or five times, and the car, our our, our driverless car, was so. Paid, Patient. He just sat there and waited and waited and waited for a long time. And fortunately, we didn't have to be anywhere. Um, and the lane to our left was completely open, and you could have gone around it. And I couldn't help but think that in New, you know, how would this go over in New Jersey? I mean, how would New Jersey drivers react to this? So, um, so that leads us to the um, to the subject of just how intelligent are these driverless cars? And um, to answer that question, we have one of the world's experts. We have Peter Rander, um, who is the president and co-founder of Argo AI. Um, this is, a, uh, this is a, a, a startup company that Ford has a stake in, uh, Ford Motor Company, and, and, and it's, uh, 
and uh, you call yourselves partners, right? In this in this Correct. autonomous vehicle uh, venture, we can talk more about that. Um, Peter has a PhD from uh, Carnegie Mellon University, which is really one of the great universities and, and, and was one of the earliest on driverless cars. I remember back uh, uh, Red Whitaker's uh, uh, autonomous all-terrain vehicles. And I remember writing about that as a young uh, reporter. Um, Peter was also part of the team that launched Uber's self-driving car program. And he is a leader in the development of complex autonomous systems and the organizations that build them. So I'm delighted to be here with uh, Peter Rander. Just imagine that there's a fireplace here and we're sitting in overstuffed uh, uh, leather chairs. So Peter. Stuffed, stuffed leather, do we, do we need a pipe too? <laughs> a pipe, pipes would be good too. Pipes. We just hold your hands out like this. So, so, so tell us, are autonomous vehicles smart enough to be dropped into the streets of New York City to, to fend for themselves in that chaotic environment? Uh, last time I checked, no one is trying that at the moment. Uh, so when you look at how smart a self-driving car is, uh, it's really hard to come up with a direct human analog because things we're really good at as humans are actually very hard quite often to get a self-driving car to do well. If I ask you, how do you recognize where the people and the tables are in this room? You'd kind of look at me and say, duh, that's kind of obvious. That actually takes effort for a, for a self-driving car. But the, the dynamics of controlling a car, moving a steering wheel and doing that, you know, as a human, we, you, anybody who's a driver went through that wonderful driver's ed process and went, this isn't so natural, right? That's actually much easier to actually do the controls for. So the times it's actually the things that we think are going to be easy or hard, things that are harder, it takes more effort. And when you get to something like New York City, we all universally agree, it's hard for everyone to drive around <laughs> in New York City. So, 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 uh, so, where are we in the evolution of autonomous vehicles? Because when we all talk about it, we talk about them as being, you know, we talk about them as being these driverless Ubers that come and pick us up and take us where we want to go. I mean, uh, how far, you know, where, where, where does the technology have to go to get us to that point? So, a lot of different companies are taking a lot of different angles of attack. At Argo, we're looking at this as, as an opportunity to work in shared mobility. Uh, where shared mobility clearly uh, works well and people want it. Uh, they want it because they're willing to already to pay for the service because it gives them either a, a service that they, they don't currently have or a convenience that they're not used to. Uh, so you get into dense urban cores. Right. All right. Others, and in those environments, you can see that uh, from your experience, you were in, in Miami and you saw the range of capabilities. Uh, we've talked about 2021 as the year that we intend to launch. Uh, of course, safety has to drive that case first. So we'll, we'll launch when we're ready, when right. that data is there. Uh, but that's different from other company strategies at looking at, at different ways of getting different kind of assistance. If you're really talking about level four self-driving though, uh, you can see that it really is at the very early, early years right now that we think, and this is gonna take quite a time period when we move from, from smaller scale deployments or very uh, geofenced areas, we say focused on a very particular area of the world that we we all map out and and have a very detailed understanding of so now so the level four you're talking about there are five levels of automation right uh, well zero would be no automation one would be like cruise control kind of thing uh, 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 two would be uh, Lane, lane assist and, and, lane assist, and which we have and, now and, correct things like that so right. your level two is where you're seeing a lot of the capabilities right. and the technologies in the in the autos that you're able to and what is today. level three level three gets into a mode where the car is largely doing the driving and it tells you uh kind of uh, i'm having trouble right now please take over right uh, and level three is tricky because you actually need to get a human to re-engage understand the situation when they may not have been engaged now, and and level four actually is the first time that you can say the human uh, the human occupants in the car don't have to pay any attention. The car is responsible for the safety of the people in the car and the shared spaces out around but the car. But level four falls short of full automation. Right? right. So level five gets us to the point that the equivalent of me giving you the keys to a car right. in, a, in a new city and just go. It's like I've never right. been there. I can I can still get my way around. Right. Okay. So, so now um, I, 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 we, we talked about this before and um, uh, we, uh, when I was at Scientific American, um, uh, we, um, 
uh, we we uh, had a uh, we, we got a, had a writer uh, named uh, Stephen Schladover, who's a, a, a you know a, a, an AI guy from UC Berkeley, and um, he said um, uh, he said that level he said that level five is fifty years away, and level four. Is um, uh, you know drivers driverless in a, in, a, in a in a in a limited in a limited circumstance as you just described. Um, so when when you talk about twenty twenty one and you talk about shared services, what is the limit? What is the limitation that's going to be on that um, that 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 keeps it in level four without going to level five? So typically, teams that are working in this area are. Are going to make sure that the systems have their own equivalent of the human over the phone. And at every intersection, you're stressed out. You don't understand the traffic patterns. You don't know the milestones or the, the, the landmarks to look for. That kind of model of driving is really hard to do, even for a human. And, and you often see people making mistakes and getting confused. You were in Miami, a tourist right. destination, happens all the time. Um, one of the points of the geofence is to make sure the car has its own memory, like a veteran driver that's been driving for decades. Right. Tons of experience. They know where the turns are. They know where the traffic flow typically is. Uh, they know where pedestrians are typically crossing, whether it's legal at that crosswalk or maybe uh, something that is not officially sanctioned by the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and understanding that gives, that's one way that, that things get very localized. Another way uh, that came up in discussions earlier was talking about different kind of weather conditions, uh, different kinds of, of topology of the roadways. Uh, are we dealing with monster 12 lane roads uh, uh, where people are not obeying any laws? Are we talking about very tightly controlled capabilities? Right. Um, city like Miami that we're in, is not the most pristine. You were down there. You saw parts of this. There are there are drivers that are uh, driving aggressively, uh, often breaking the rules and breaking the law. But there's a lot of pedestrians with uh, with shopping carts or wheelchairs or bicyclists that literally are riding in the wrong lane of traffic in the wrong flow right. and dodging in between. Cars. Yeah, we had we, we were driving and and some guy was this is I don't see this too much. I see a lot in New York where someone this guy was crossing a three lane. Uh, a three lane on each side, or at least two lanes. Lanes in the middle of the road, waiting for the traffic on the other side to clear so he could cross. But our car just came to a halt and let him. You know, it was a driverless car and let him cross. It was it was very safe, and he looked very uh, he looked very reassured. But I think you know because he probably didn't know it was driverless. It was probably. I, I, mean, I wonder what his reaction would have been if he realized that there was no one actually, no human actually uh, uh, driving that car. Well, that's part of what's exciting about getting out there too. From our standpoint, in order to begin to get out there, we've gone through a series of tests to be yeah. ready to make sure that we were able to uh, operate uh, responsibly in the space. But partly then the benefit that comes from it is not just for us in the development of this, but for, for the people in the city to start to learn, well, what kind of interactions are there? What does right. it look like? And you right. see, a wide range of responses early on when people are, are, are uh, it's, it's, it catches their eye quite often. But over time, they get more comfortable, more used to it, and oh, okay, I can learn uh, that thing right. is, is, uh, is not stalking me. It's just trying to do its drive, drive along right. the road, and I'm doing my thing. And it's right. a shared space, right? And so right. that's what you right. get. You get this much more natural feeling as people learn to get comfortable. Not everyone is comfortable at the beginning. So, um, uh, you, you know, you mentioned safety, and um, uh, you know, safety is uh, very important to Ford. It's very important to everyone. Um, but uh, now, one of the things that my the, the writer, uh, that writer Stephen Schladover, um, said in that in that in that story that I edited for Scientific American, he said that humans are actually pretty good drivers. The fatal crashes occur once in every 3.3 million hours of driving. Um, and injuries, uh, uh, crashes that involve an injury occur only once in every 64,000 hours of driving. Um, uh, you know, we see a lot of fatalities and a lot of injuries because everyone's always driving. So there are a lot of driver hours, but that's a pretty good uh, safety record. Can, can AVs do better? 
I'm confident they will do better. So, and it's interesting. We heard this discussion, the, the facts this morning. Uh, over 90% of the uh, of the accidents that uh, do occur uh, actually are traced back to human error. Um, humans can, when they're at the top of their game, do amazing things with an automobile. It's just phenomenal. Mm. Uh, go to the most extreme and you look at race cars and they're like, the tires are rarely actually just on the ground. There's constantly sliding and, and incredibly tight maneuvering. But to have that level of vigilance every single moment at every single time, how much temptation is there to reach into your pocket to start doing a little bit of this? Right. Well, all right. To do a little I've bit never, of this, I've never done that. Never done any of that, right? So that kind of thing, or or simply to get tired. If you've been driving and you've worked, you know, I I, I almost got hit by a car uh, heading to work one day on a on a poor woman that had worked the double shift at a hospital, and and it was a highway situation, and you could see the car. She was I don't know half a mile away. Suddenly, a car like something looks weird about the behavior of the car on the other side of the highway. But there was a weaving motion and then an overcompensation and then a radical overcompensation, probably as she's coming to full alertness and she ends up in the median and almost hits my car on the other side of the highway, right? She's working a double shift, right? She was just tired. And it wasn't that she was on mm -hmm. a 12-hour marathon drive. It was just her commute home. Right. So that's what's really hard for humans to do. Yeah. So can AVs actually do do better? The wonderful thing about AVs is we have to design the systems uh, to handle the, the cases at one time, and then they don't have all these other distractions or, or, or other exhaustion right. factors to come into play. So that's the opportunity I see for AVs to be dramatically safer. Um, so so you, you say AVs will be dramatically safer, but are they now dramatically safer? Um, I mean, do, you, are, do, the, do, the, do the statistics show less, uh, fewer uh, accidents, fewer injuries, fewer fatalities? So, I, I know of only one fatality, uh, and that was that horrific uh, the video that Rick, I think it was, I don't want to mention that, but I'm not sure uh, which test it was, but it, there was a a, 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 a a person was was crossing with with her bicycle on a dark street, and the the autonomous car had a human sitting there supposedly monitoring, but it, it all happened very quickly, and and the woman was killed. It was it was horrific. So I, that, that's the only fatality that I know of. I think there was another one with the Tesla, which was not the car's fault. Was the you know it was this uh, right? So the the Tesla system is not striving to be a level four system. That is a driver assist function, right. and as Tesla has gone to uh, recently increased the uh, the amount of information they've got now, they're really making it clear this is an assistant. You're still responsible. Right. Uh, but on so how how safe are they today? Right. Today, c companies like Argo, certainly Argo specifically, we are in a development phase. So getting to 2021, so it's kind of a different kind of question. How safe is the car is partly how safe is the system that's operating. Mm -hmm. We're always sending two people out in the car uh, as, as part of a driver crew. Uh, there's a person behind the wheel who has their hands uh, right up on the wheel, and part of their training is to learn to keep their hands close by to give to minimize the reaction time. All they need to do is, is just grab the wheel to intervene at a moment's notice. Uh, and there's a whole uh, whole training process that gets them ready to be able to do that, to learn what the car would do if it started to do something bad. How would that feel? How would they learn to react to not overreact? There's also a person in the passenger front seat, uh, the co-driver, uh, who has a, a computer that they're able to understand what the self-driving system is thinking at the moment. And if they can recognize uh, uh, warning signs, indicators of trouble, uh, they can alert the driver to say, don't even let the situation unfold. Um, those two people are, are are often rotated around so that they're not getting too comfortable. You know, your right. buddies, and now nah, I won't talk about it if you don't talk about it. So to keep alert and fresh. And there's a constant uh, uh, retraining period that's going on as we work to bring the latest information about how the car is behaving and giving uh, the people who are in those cars a deeper understanding as they get increase their knowledge about uh, about what's going on, keeps them alert, keeps them engaged, and, and, and keeps them doing everything. Because ultimately, the driver, legally, uh, right. the way we operate, the little driver is responsible for the operation of the car. And so we want them always to be remembering. You be vigilant, your co-driver is vigilant, the car's doing its best, and you're here as its mentor right now uh, to make sure it doesn't get into trouble. Right, right. No, I, I, well, I, I felt very safe, like I say. Um, now, this is, a, this is a great question for you because um, uh, 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 the Ford folks made, made this argument, and I believe it's, they have a point that, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, to have a, a car company um, uh, dealing with uh, 
uh, autonomous vehicles or, or looking to make autonomous vehicles comes comes at the problem uh, differently from a company like Uber, or, which you know does not have a long history of manufacturing mass manufacturing cars, and so this is a really good question, I think, for for you guys, and that is, how do you make sure? Now, because I assume that when you the software that that is going to control these cars is not going to be static; it's going to be updated, right? Um, and 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 so. Um, the 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 uh, the pro the problem that autonomous vehicles have to deal with in in, in 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 making sure they're not you know dealing with all the chaos and the obstacles and all this is very very complicated, far more complicated I'm told than say the uh, the autopilot on an airplane, um, and um, you know decisions on airplanes are made uh, you know you know you have some time I mean there's not a tree coming at you you're up and you know, you know there's maybe a plane miles away, and, and you, 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 the, the, so the software has to make decisions on the orders of tens of seconds, whereas in a car, it's a fraction of a second. And so um, so this adds to the complexity of the software by many orders of magnitude, according to my guru, Stephen Shadlover. And um, how, so how do you test this software? How do you make sure that the software is safe? How do you, uh, you know, r r run it for enough hours to make sure that all the bugs are out of it. So there's no one thing. When it comes to, to engineering safety into a system, you really need a, a multifaceted approach. Uh, it starts down, uh, people writing software literally are writing small little tests around pieces of software to say it's supposed to do this, do my little test that I know exactly how this is supposed to work. So does it work? Because with software changing, I knew it, of course it works the first time, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't send it out the first time, but it's those increments, right. those little changes. Uh, and, and it progresses through a series of stages where you're testing more and more of the capabilities. Uh, when we get to the closed course testing, a uh, number of steps down the road, we've already been through gates of extensive simulation-based testing, where you actually have the uh, kind of the virtual car is now driving in a virtual world of sorts, right. and, and looking at ways that you can, you can put it into difficult situations and go, well, did it respond uh, reasonably? Did it respond appropriately? It may not do the dream scenario of, of threading the needle and maintaining speed, but that's not what we always need to do. Sometimes we need to say, you know, the right thing to do right now is to slow down, pull over, and just stop. We'll let the situation clear. Right. Uh, uh, but on the closed course, you have to make this leap from this virtual world, this bits, to the physical world. Right? The physical world, you actually need to say, was my simulation model accurate enough? So you're running a series of tests close course uh, where you actually put other cars in motion with, uh, you know, basically trained drivers who understand what's going on. It's part of a test and know that it might not go correctly. And at any point through these kind of gates, if you see a problem where you go, wait a minute, that's not right. You stop the process, you send it back, that process kind of the process fails, you catch it and you go back and say, well, what happened? How did we get there? Uh, and, and quite often we're looking at both repairing the individual problem and asking ourselves, is there a broader lesson we can learn about the process mm -hmm. that's getting there? Um, so that, that whole okay. engineering process is going on long before we hit, we hit public roads. Out on public roads then, there's the safety protocol that we've been discussing about while we have an operator, a driver, a co-driver. And there we're looking to develop that real world experience. On a closed course, you're just not going to be able to create the breadth of, of, of right. uh, examples you're going to find in the real world, okay. um, in the physical world. And so there, you're going out again with the safety mentality that says, uh, until we've accrued enough evidence that says it is safe to remove the driver, uh, I need to keep gathering more evidence. I need to keep improving the system. Yeah, one what, what, one of the uh, one of the people uh, gathering, you know, with the laptop when, when we were driving, waiting for this person to parallel park. She says, "Well, we're collecting a lot of really good data." Um, so one final yeah, question. One final question, and I'll move on. Um, so, so these one of the things that makes this all possible is machine learning, right? Is as the ability to, of of these machines to encounter situations and learn from their mistakes. Or, um, uh, what happens when we have thousands of, of driverless cars out there, each one learning? Uh, learning from its own mistakes or learning from its experience, the way humans learn from our experiences. How do you, uh, how do you ensure, uh, um, how do you ensure that uh, uh, 
you know, doesn't doesn't that create a kind of a safety problem in a way because you've got you've got individual machines you've got you know you've got you, you know you know one person's car has learned a whole bunch of behaviors and uh, it's different from another person's car how do you deal with that so it, you could get into serious trouble if you allowed each system to do what we what we call online learning where the car is literally learning on the fly and the next time it encounters situation it may change how it behaves based on that last one uh, but machine learning is actually a very broad field of different techniques and often uh, and as Argo uses them we do a lot of work in the engineering design phase with machine learning to help us um, and we get to be in the loop before we allow it, uh, a new software product to go back out on the road so what we're learning on the road when we say yes we're collecting that data both the good and the bad examples where yeah the car didn't do the right thing or the good ones to reinforce good behavior the learning is not going on on the individual car that data is coming back uh, we as humans then are able to to look at this and say that's a bad example <laughs> don't mm -hmm. don't do that behavior again instead do something different and then to retrain the system and then measure it against those exact cases again and okay. say, ah, okay, did you learn the right behavior? And what we're able to do then across the fleet is that maybe your car was the only one that had the encounter, but suddenly the whole fleet can get smarter okay. and we can maintain control over the process so that okay. we have a prayer of doing That's this. That's reassuring. So it's, it's more like the, my car learns something and tells everybody else and then they deal with it back there. Correct. But this would be a very good premise for a movie, wouldn't it? This would be a wonderful okay. premise for a movie. I, I yes. think, well, fact, I think <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I, we need to end this so I can go write the screenplay. So let's, uh, well, no, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will uh, reserve questions at the moment. Uh, I'd like to bring our other panelists together, and, and I'd like you to stay up. Can you stay up okay. uh, here? Because we'll have Q&A, and then people will have questions for you because you've been so interesting. Um, uh, why don't you just slide over there maybe a little bit? Uh, do I have five? Yeah, no, we're going to need... Is there an order you want us to sit in? No, um, I should probably be on one end. But, um, there are four of you plus... Plus Peter, right? Uh, this is I'll, I'll sit over here. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Do you feel about it? He wants me to No, it doesn't. It doesn't. The chair over there. Right there. Yeah, that's fine. So there's. Sorry. Oh, we don't have. He's getting a chair right there. Oh, you're getting a chair. Wow, we have a lot. Okay. Um, why, don't you stay, why don't you stay there, and I'll just <clears throat> oh, um, let's grab, I'll just grab one of these. And why don't we? Um, so you need to be kind of. You do you have that to spare? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, so the, the deal with the uh, the deal with the microphones is there. You don't have to get right up on them, but you don't want to be too far away from them. So you're, you're a little far, so if you're going to answer a question, you've got to lean way in. <laughs> the rest of you are, and, and, and uh, uh, Robin, you too, so the rest, but the rest of you are probably okay. Um, so 100 years ago, um, the first cars um, shared, the streets, shared the streets with bicycles, pedestrians, and horses. And one of the reasons that they were, that they were hailed was that the more people would drive through cars, the, the, the less horse maneuver there would be in the streets. <laughs> and uh, as we know, cars have, have really helped in, in to get rid of horse manure. Um, but they also brought us a lot of things like urban blight and suburban sprawl, sprawl and traffic and people who don't exercise because they're trapped in commuting in their traffic jams and things like that. So, so what happened? Why did this happen? Why didn't cars usher in the cars, the cars will give us some good things, too. But why didn't they usher in this utopian future that maybe some people um, uh, thought they would? And, and the answer to that is that uh, was offered in um, my, uh, my colleague Dave Friedman's excellent piece in Newsweek. He said that the, the, the streets, we, see, we let, he said we let the cars flood the streets and only afterwards worried about how to manage them. Um, this, ses this session is about how to avoid a similar fate with, with ABs. Um, just, to, just to sort of set the stage a little bit, and then I'll let um, the panelists talk. Um, 
some of the things that, that you know, there, there, there's, there's a general assumption that, that these cars are going to be shared and that they're going to, they're going to whiz along at lightning speed and there's no traffic jams and we're all going to be able to snap our fingers and a car will appear and drop us off wherever we are. But there are certain, there are certain things that need to be done uh, if that future, if we're going to have that future. Um, roads, if roads aren't redesigned to accommodate uh, where we drop people off, we're going to create this huge traffic jam. Um, if, if people don't share rides, there'll actually be more vehicles in the street. If if uh, if car if if uh, AVs aren't privately are privately owned, if we each buy our own one, uh, you know you can imagine people sending uh, sending their cars out, dropping you off to work, and then sending your car around on errors or circling the streets waiting to pick you up at the end of the day. That would be a disaster. Um, if suburbs don't encourage um, uh, a development around um, you know, hubs of sort of the quasi-urban hubs that are connected maybe by high-speed arteries. If they just let the technology over, overwhelm them passively, then we may get even more sprawl than we have now. Um, you know, if we don't, if we don't uh, accommodate under-resourced areas and marginalized people, we uh, we could make our, our our currently very bad problems with inequality, income inequality, and wealth inequality even worse. So, uh, um, and to summarize, um, again, today's excellent article, um, driverless cars seem to be leading us into two possible futures. One is, um, you know, where you have this vast potential to solve our problems. The other is if we, if we just flood the streets and, and let them overwhelm, overwhelm us. And so we're going to try to figure out how do we can get one without getting, how to, how to, get, how, how to get future one without getting future two. So, with that said, um, I would like to um, introduce. I'll, I'll, I, I'm going to introduce the panelists. One, I'm going to give you an introduction before you give your spiel, rather than introduce you all. So, um, the first up is Ellen Dunham Jones. Ellen is um, a professor of urban design at Georgia Technology Georgia Institute of Technology. She's an authority on suburban redevelopment. She has been named one of the 100 most influ influential urbanists by Planetize. Planetizer. Oh, is that what I'm for? Planetizer. Okay. <laughs> Planet oh, Planet. Planet I get it. Planetizer. <laughs> uh, she's also the co author of a forthcoming book out this year called. Retrofitting Suburbia Case Studies Designs for the 21st Century Challenge. It's coming out in 2019, so order it now on Amazon. And I'd like to give the uh, chair to that. Great. Thank you so much, Fred. Um, so I'm going to start a little just with you know, defining for what I find to be the heaven-hell scenario. So hell is doubled congestion, and lots of studies showing that, again, uh, way more sprawl, chopping down more trees, exacerbating climate change further and further, and encouraging, you know, we've had centuries of every, almost every culture believing that as you get wealthier, you get more privacy, and that's our number one goal. We are at the point today, of uh, last year, the former Surgeon General said the U.S. is in, has a loneliness epidemic, severely affecting uh, public health. And so just if we see that sprawl future, just more privacy, everybody gets a driver, everybody's in there, even more in their bubble caused by all of this, um, you know, lots and lots of problems. I think it will, it, again, hell would be an even exacerbated divide between rich and poor as people can separate themselves physically, rich and poor places, rich and poor people. I worry already about another, a new form of redlining where redlining was the practice where banks wouldn't lend to neighborhoods that had an, a percentage of black families in them. Um, as we are seeing the suburbanization of poverty, we're seeing more opportunity, uh, sort of I worry that there will be companies that will just sort of say, oh, no, those they don't have the 5G networks out there that we, and they aren't maintaining their roads. 
with enough really fresh paint and striping, you know, we don't go there. So suddenly you're going to also find the services, the autonomous vehicle services not available in poor neighborhoods. Um, and there's even more nightmare scenarios about the kind of captive advertising and monopoly possibilities that could be the solutions to some of those quote unquote, quote unquote solutions. Um, the heaven side for me has much more to do with the really positive impacts that we've already uh, talked about, I think, in the first panel on the impacts on street life, parking, and transit. I want to talk a little bit more about that. Imagine once uh, the assumption is that most AVs will be electric vehicles for a whole bunch of reasons. So imagine what walking down a street that suddenly is all electric cars. The, the, the street will be quieter. There will be way, the, the air will be cleaner. There will be, there will be all the safety features. Uh, the lanes can be narrower because these cars are so precise. Much more space for the bike lanes, for the wider sidewalks. Uh, so suddenly street life can become a much more attractive, more desirable uh, place and allowing for then the redevelopment of all those parking spaces into really attractive, compelling, the kinds of urban places that we'd like to go to on vacation, we might actually be at want to live in uh, more frequently. And then transit, uh, I think, becomes the other, you know, uh, there's obviously the, for the first last mile potential, but there's also where you have the, the potential now, right now, uh, 50 to 85 percent of the operating cost of a bus goes to the driver. When you do not have that driver, instead of having one big bus that comes every 30 minutes, for the same price, a, transport, a transit agency could have three or four smaller shuttle buses that come every five or 10 minutes. The frequency and convenience of being able to expand transit to areas that can't currently support it is phenomenal, is a game changer, again, for potentially uh, for all of this. So to me, that has a lot to do with heaven. Um, I do think that right now, cities already have the infrastructure for this kind of shared mobility and have a lot of obvious um, uh, benefits to sort of enhance the qualities they already have. The, suburb, the suburbs, both have more to potentially gain because they could finally have transit and have more affordable housing building. They have the, the streetscapes right now of the, the dominated by parking lots could become much more uh, vibrant, attractive, healthy, sustainable places. But the suburbs also potentially have much more to lose with the doubling of congestion if it simply becomes this private <laughs> autonomous vehicle world. So it's really essential that every community figure out for itself. It's not one blanket solution, but figure out for itself what are the major challenges that each community faces and how do they leverage AVs to achieve the future that they actually you know, want um, for their community. And so whether that means that they're really focused on how do we reduce traffic and grow or whether they're worried about issues of affordability, when they're worried about the issues of loneliness um, and want to build more stronger community social hubs. Uh, there's so many opportunities, I think, for AVs to help us address a lot of these issues. I, I agree with uh, Mark Villaverne that they're not the silver bullet, but they can really help us make a difference if we plan appropriately. Okay. Thank you. Um, it sounds a lot like heaven to me, but we'll, 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 it's okay. Um, it's the have, heaven to avoid it, that. It doesn't have to be all fire and boots. Okay, <laughs> ne next up is uh, uh, Carrie Watkins. Carrie is um, uh, the Frederick Law Olmsted Associate Professor of Civil Engineering and Environmental Engineering here at Georgia Tech. Um, and uh, she's got a list of accomplishments, the, the, the length of your arm, but I'm going to uh, tell you one, just one short anecdote um, about her that, that we'll, we'll, we'll tell you even more. Um, uh, uh, Carrie grew up in Detroit, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, which is Car City. Um, and um, 
then at, at 16, uh, went to lived in Germany for uh, for a while, and uh, was amazed at how easy it was to get around uh, in Germany without a car. I mean, uh, you know, trains and trolleys and whatnot. Um, and that gave her this. She realized at that moment that she wanted to devote her life to uh, to uh, the transportation engineering. And so that was a that was a that's a, was a great life uh, life life change. And so um, uh, Carrie's going to tell us a little bit about uh, shared uh, shared versus unshared service. So um, I'm thrilled to be on the Hellion panel. Um, I'm often the optimist in the room, so I love getting the chance to be one of the pessimists. Um, I, uh, what I'm here to talk about a little bit is the concept of sharing. Um, around the time that I was in undergraduate here at Georgia Tech, which was a long time ago, um, there was a book by a man named Robert Fulgram called Everything You Need to Know You Learned in Kindergarten. And as a college professor, I probably shouldn't be touting a book like that um, because we essentially make our livelihood on making sure that you can learn things beyond kindergarten. Uh, but in this book, he listed out all the things that we first learned when we were kindergartners that were really the lessons for life that should have carried us forward for the rest of our lives. And if we would only think back to some of those lessons, uh, that they would do us a lot of good. So. One of my favorite ones in it was that when we go out into the world, we need to ha hold hands and look out for traffic. And I think that as a transportation professional, that's very much true, um, <laughs> one of our problems in this world. But the number one thing that he put on this list was that we need to share everything. And when we were kindergartners, we learned that we had to share our crayons and our paste. and. But as adults, we tend to forget this. Um, and I know Robin has a whole career built on this idea of, of sharing. Um, and I approach this within the context of transportation. There are two ways that if we're going to fix the transportation system, we have to be sharing. Um, one of those is that when we look towards driverless vehicles, they have to be fleet vehicles. They have to be shared. And there is this implicit assumption that they will be. But yet we're seeing models like Tesla being the first ones to hit the street. And these are in no way those shared vehicles. So we have nothing in place right now to actually guarantee that this is true. And so this is a pretty poor assumption because there's actually a lot more evidence to the opposite that, that you know we are going to individually own these vehicles. Most of the price points, and you probably can talk to this, as, as this technology becomes more commonplace, it's believed that it's only gonna cost about 10 to 15% more than what a typical vehicle today, the equivalent vehicle would in the future. But there's a second level of sharing that is critically important as well. And this is this idea, if we imagine a fleet vehicle, this is like the TNCs that exist today, Uber and Lyft are our but only 20% of the trips that are taken in TNCs, only 20% of the trips requested, not even taken, are actually in Uber pool and Lyft line where we're actually sharing that vehicular space. And so we end up in a situation where there is a lot of wasted space in urban environments. And that will continue unless we're actually sharing within those vehicles as well. So the problem is that to date, there's very little policy that is actually pushing us towards ensuring that these two sharing situations are actually occurring when we look towards the introduction of driverless vehicles. But there are a couple of ways to, to be more heavenly for a minute. There are a couple of ways that we could be doing this. Uh, the first is dedicating right of way towards shared vehicles. And we can do that today, bus rapid transit, other things that we're doing in order to make sure that transit vehicles are getting priority, HOV lanes and such, to make sure that shared vehicles are getting priority, those become so much more important when we look towards driverless vehicles. And the other way is looking towards pricing this in a, in a complete way, where we're actually using VMT taxes, things like that, congestion pricing, to ensure that the miles that you drive, you're being held accountable for. 
from an environmental perspective, but also just from a space perspective. If, if you want to, you know, take your driverless vehicle to work and, and send it home as a zero occupant vehicle, that's fine, but you're going to pay a lot of money to do so to that you're going to cause on the network. And so I encourage our policymakers in the room and listening that these are the kinds of things that we need to be pushing for to make sure that we don't hit our, our health scenario. Okay, great. Thank you. Our next guest is uh, David Zipper. Um, David is a resident fellow at the German Marshall Fund, and he is a partner in the 19th, uh, 1776 Venture Fund uh, that oversees investments in, in smart cities and mobility. And he was the, um, the former director of the New York City Business Solutions in Mayor Bloomberg's office, right? And he has also worked for a couple of uh, Washington, D.C. mayors. Uh, David. Uh, thank you. It's good to be here. Um, and I, yeah, you mentioned that I have a good bit of experience working in city governments. And I also do a lot of work now with transit agencies, the American Public Tran uh, Transit Association, Transportation Association. So I have a sort of practitioner's view on this. And my personal v vision of hell with AV is, is a little different. I actually, my vision of hell is that all the hullabaloo around AV is so much media attention, so much popular discussion crowds out the immediate urgent questions that we need to be having now around how to improve our cities and improve urban mobility. Because these AVs are not coming uh, in a widespread way anytime super soon. And, and to, to dive into a little bit further, you know, I, you know, some of this came up in the prior panel. Road deaths are rising up from 30,000 in 2010 to just, I believe it, 38,000 last year. We all know that climate change is getting much, much worse year by year, in fact, exponentially worse by many estimates. Transit ridership is falling in almost every American city right now, with the exceptions of Seattle and Houston, maybe a couple others as well. And, and by the way, it's transit that's going to be able to move a lot of people at scale to ensure that we can have the uncongested, equitable cities that we want to have. And congestion is getting much, much worse in cities like New York and Washington, D.C., where I live. Uh, yeah, this is... And, and, and so our cities now are, and this is what we're seeing now, they're getting more congested, they're less safe, they're more polluting, and they're less equitable because of transit uh, suffering. And this is what we're experiencing at the moment. And yet, and yet AVs dominate so much of the popular discussion, I worry that it can be a real distraction. I, my vision, of another example of hell, in Miami Beach, there was a mayor who said a couple of years ago, yeah, I don't know that we need streetcar we should just hold off on streetcar because AVs are coming and we should just wait. That is such a dangerous mentality that public transit, hey, it's okay, it can go away, AVs will take us. This is something I see in Washington with the underinvestment right now in our pretty extensive mass transit system, WMATA or Metro. So, but AVs will eventually come to cities. It's actually interesting though, you, uh, I have a, a venture capital background, I've worked with startups I was with a big gathering of VCs, and their consensus among these mobility VCs is that actually the opportunity financially as an investor in the next five to 10 years has shifted much more toward freight and away from passenger transit. That's where they see the real movement and action happening because it's so much easier, especially on those, those main highway interstate miles, to move that way. But eventually, again, you know, we're starting to see you know, Waymo's pilot. We all know about this in Arizona and other pilots as well. There will be some introduction of AVs in, in, into cities, but it's going to take time. And, you know, th this idea of coexistence, I think, is a really important one. Um, you know, Deborah Lamb from Georgia Tech said in the pre previous panel that there's going to be a long time when AVs will coexist with traditional vehicles. That's certainly true because the average lifespan of a car in this country is 30 years mm -hmm. and we're not selling any AVs yet. So it's going to be a long while before we have this futuristic all AV world. Like it's going to be a long, long time before that. And also, I actually would part ways a little bit with your estimate about how expensive AVs will be vis-a-vis -vis traditional cars. The estimates I've seen are, are significantly more than a 10 to 15% premium, maybe way down the road. But at least for, the, for a while, they're going to be really expensive. They're going to be probably too expensive for most, most residents to be able to purchase, even if they can want to drive it just for themselves. 
So I think this idea of like the urban fleet, like like shared rides, tax service is is much more likely to happen. You're already seeing it again with the, with the Waymo example, but it's going to be one of many. That's the other version of coexistence. You, you could have AV. Um, AV uh, uh, a taxi service along with the other modes like traditional car rides and walking and biking and again transit which is so important and so that's where I come to in terms of what we should be doing now again don't just focus on this futuristic AV world that's going to be a long time coming when we're all zipping around with just AVs on, on, on the roads of cities particularly cities that have complicated weather patterns like where I live uh, but what we can do is make it easy. This is what we all want, at least many of us in the, in the urbanist world, is for people not to own their own cars. Let's make it easy for people not to own their own car by bringing together the various modes, which are constantly with micro-mobility, the scooters, now unicycles, all kinds of things that people are using as the price of batteries falls and they get better. Let's make it easy with this term called mobility as a service to be able to find all the modes to get around your city. And then when AVs do arrive, we plug that in. And you want to pay premium ticket AV ride, you do. But in the meantime, we can have this interoperable uh, uh, mechanism to let us navigate cities, not these walled gardens that Uber and Lyft are starting to build. And the other thing that we can do, which I strongly recommend that cities think harder about, is to recognize that in a multimodal world, it doesn't really make sense to have this balkanized government, government, uh, governance structure we have with cities, where you have a city DOT alongside a, t a, a ride hail, and, and limo uh, it, uh, a regulator, you, and then that's separate from a transit agency, sometimes there's others as well. We need to have some sort of a combined transit authority or transportation authority that looks out for how to balance these modes against each other. Like what you see in tran Transport for London, Vancouver has this, San Francisco does, but it's exceptionally rare in this, in this country. So that to me, like heaven in my mind, is focused on what we can address now. Hell is let AV crowd out every other urgent conversation while our city's future is at stake. That's terrific, thank you Thanks so much. Uh, okay, and uh, last but definitely not least, uh, Robin Chase. Um, Robin is a transportation entrepreneur. Um, she is the uh, co-founder and former CEO of Zipcar, uh, which is the largest car sharing company in the world. Um, she is a co-founder of Venium, which is a network company that, that moves uh, terabytes of data between cars and the cloud. And uh, she is the author of the book, Peers, Inc., How People and Platforms Are Inventing the Collaborative Economy and Reinventing Capitalism. Um, Robin, take it away. Um. I think that we're, if you think of Dante, I think we're already in maybe the second circle of hell <laughs> for, from a transportation perspective, that we're spending 20 to 40% of our income on our cars, we're living in congestion, we have climate change, we, we're already in hell. And I, the autonomous vehicles will take us to that seventh inner circle of hell, I think, very quickly. Thinking about it, I, if, if you think about right now, when you have a car, you think to yourself, oh, it's just the cost of gas and maybe tolls, and maybe parking, and that's the basis on which I make that trip, right? So I basically put it insignificant. When we go to personal autonomous vehicles, what people don't realize is, wow, I never even counted my body in that equation. And so now, if we have electric autonomous vehicles, the marginal cost, which is what we really use to think about this, the marginal cost will come to about 50 cents an hour to move that car. This is Lou Fulton and UC Davis's numbers. And so it's 50 cents an hour to move a car. What would you not do with it? What errand would you not set it off on? Where would you not let it go? And to make you really imagine this, think when smartphones first had cameras, you said, sure, whatever, you know, I take pictures on vacations and birthday parties. And now each of us uses that camera for 10 different things in a day. That's what will happen when we have our personal slave car at 50 cents an hour to do whatever the hell we want. So this congestion piece is deeply, let me just take one more piece of health before I talk to solutions. The other kind of health that no one's talked about is okay. It's 50 cents an hour to move that car. If you are a company, if you were ever doing any kind of retail downtown, why in hell would you pay for expensive downtown retail if I could bring the car to you? I can bring that service to you. 
the liquor store car, the latte car, <laughs> the shoe store car, the makeup car, whatever it is that you want, these because the way we price today, which is we don't price, those cars will be circling the streets and will be the way cheaper thing to do. So while we've been talking a lot about personal usage of cars, hell, I want to put in your mind this other kind, and I call it retail autonomous trips, rats. So think of a hell of rats, and rats in countrysides are actually not so bad, but rats in cities are something we really <laughs> care about. And I would go with Ellen, that density really, really matters when you think about town vehicle policy. But so let's talk about what it is that you would do given these two types of hell that are certainly coming for us. And why are they coming for us like this? Because we have spent the last hundred years making personal cars cheap and easy. And we have underpriced everything. So we have underpriced air quality and we have to start. So I want to just to to what David says, we need to address problems that are here now. And that means when autonomous vehicles come in, all good. So what do we need to address here now? The air quality that locally causes huge numbers of asthma cases and on the global perspective is a causing climate change. We don't charge for that. Everyone's got a free ride. Have to change that. Because AVs aren't necessarily going to be electric. We have to make sure that that's more expensive. We don't charge for congestion anywhere. And if we're not going to have me sending out my car at 50 cents an hour, you have to do congestion pricing. If you want me to think twice, you have to, or, or, or retail trips. We have to make congestion cars have more um, space reallocation. Wait, other things we don't charge for is curbs, curb access and parking. It's underpriced. Every single place, including New York City, every single place is underpriced, access to that curve. And as we have more and more on-demand delivery, we have more and more freight, double parking in streets, it's the problems that we're having now we have to address, cost of curve access. So coming down to this kind of conclusion, um, a year and a half ago I convened uh, 10 of the world's largest city and transport NGOs, and we came up with these, a vision of what's the future we want for cities, which I would say is shared, resilient, safe, multimodal transportation, and what are the 10 ways we get there? The 10th of these is autonomous vehicles in dense metropolitan areas must be shared. And why must they be shared? Because when I decide to use one, I have to pay the whole full smack in costs, the cost of depreciation, insurance, congestion, air quality. I have to pay it all when I make the decision to take that car. And then, then I will decide, do I want to buy a seat or do I want to buy the whole car? Because I have to pay the full cost to make that decision a rational one. So the shared mobility principles are things that we had 170 entities, NGOs, and private sector service providers have signed up for. And they have these three tools embedded that I think are key, which is we have to start guaranteeing and pricing for moving towards zero emission vehicles that would be renewable, we have to make efficient use of our lanes and spaces, lanes and curbs and vehicles, and we should price for that. We have to think about space reallocation cities and I think fair user fees across all modes, which we definitely don't do fair user fees across all modes. Fair space allocation across all modes. And if we start rationalizing, these are the ways you get to that city that we want. We don't have it today, but we want to get there. How and, the, and these are the methods. So I'll stop. Okie doke. Wow. All right. Man, these, these are fabulous. It's not going to be awful. <laughs> um, I, I wrote a book on uh, the existential risks to humankind, so I'm really used to this kind of thing. Um, that was really great. Thank you. Uh, what, a, what a bunch of um, really smart and knowledgeable people. Um, I'd like to throw it open to questions now. Okay, I'm right here. Thank you. Ms. Chase. Uh, Interesting comments that you just made there. Uh, if I'm a, if I want my own vehicle and I want it in my own personal space, and I don't want to do it with anybody else. Why would I go to the maybe I just drive my own car? Um, you could absolutely drive your own car, and I'm hope I think it will be years and years until we prevent you from driving your own car. Please drive your own car, but I want you to pay the actual price that it costs to drive that. Today you do not. No one does. And so when you so. And, and I think you can also have a shared AV that is your private space. It's going to be the whiskey closet, leather seats, AV. Great, some cost of fortune. I'm a regular person, and I commute to work, and I'm going to buy a seat and a regular AV. But we'll have the whole suite of things, and you can do whatever you want. I just need the pricing correct.
everybody's going to love this question. So is, is part of my life, as a child, I would go to the post office and my cousin, and she would buy stuff from Sears and fill out a paper form in the post office and put money order and mail it. And then Sears would ship the package and actually part of the post office and drop it in the mailbox. And now we have Amazon. <coughs> we are able to get about 50 gallons a week in cardboard. And for, Sears just went bankrupt. And what's the only difference in my mind between Sears and Amazon is that Amazon went after the internet and Sears hung on to that 300 page catalog for as long as they could. They already had the distribution service. Just closed the stores and here's the internet. But they knowingly and willingly drove themselves out of business. What I see with Detroit, like your car, which I think you should have, and this gas is crazy, is it's, it's much worse than people believe. The self driving car sounds really fascinating because a lot of us watch the different events. At least not cartoons or the Jets. But people work from home. I work from home all the time. I, I've got one gig service. I can attend meetings. I can do anything I want. But I don't have to call anyone. So I'm thinking more about doing more walking than driving. I, I don't want to own a car. I don't want to own a car. I just bought a bicycle. But the question is, how can, and I think Robin did the best job so far, how can we develop an image of what we are going to be changing to when it comes to how vehicles interact with the machines? What will the spectrum of cost and opportunity and liability we get rid of all these deaths that are occurring and we accept? That is my real question. I, I'll jump on that. I've done a lot of research into why I see what's happening with the dead series and all of that stuff. But the retail is kind of a, a separate question. But I think the um, the question of envisioning change is is a, a really important one. Uh, City of Atlanta. I, I wrote just a, a little bit in the Newsweek issue. City of Atlanta commissioned my urban design studio to give, to give us a give a 25 year vision of what will downtown Atlanta, how do we, what should the really walkable street grid be? And we also then looked at uh, how did, the, once we figured out what that vision sort of wanted to be, right now downtown Atlanta has 95,000 parking spaces and 5,500 residents in the core. Uh, the streets are all designed just to move as many commuters as quickly as possible through downtown streets onto the freeways out to the burbs. Um, so very clear problems. Once you begin to then es establish an alternative vision, draw it, give people a chance to sort of see it, we were able to show that by actually just building on half of the parking lots, autonomous and making assumptions that autonomous vehicles wouldn't need as much parking, we were able to accommodate uh, easily 60,000 new residents and students looking at all sorts of different different kinds of neighborhoods, a bicycle-oriented neighborhood, an urban ag-oriented neighborhood, an arts district. Um, that, so that at least now the city was able to then take those that study out to the public and actually say, would this get you interested in living in downtown? Today, downtown is looking at three major major redevelopment options that are now actually some of them very much pushing the idea of shared streets with autonomous vehicles way reduced parking regulations what it get and and pushing the city to sort of say okay rewrite your zoning regulations rewrite your parking regulations big especially huge think about completely restriping the streets so that there's much more space for walking for shared shared streets um, we're really, and we're really sort of sitting up, but it's, it does take having a vision of sort of where where one wants to go. I think it also takes having a certain belief structure. I know I'm an outlier in Atlanta, and I gave up my car four years ago. I bike. I bike, but it, I only had the confidence to do it because of Zipcar and Uber and Lyft as my backup. Knowing that they, I don't actually use them much at all. But 
that gave me the comfort to be able to make those changes in my personal case. I make the exact same thing. I don't have a car either, and you're and I bike most of the way, and having the backup is huge. Uh, I'm just curious, in, in Atlanta, do you have sidewalk breeze? Yeah. Um, hasn't happened. So we've started to see those in Washington and they get like punted and, and like, <laughs> harassed and abused and it's kind of hilarious. But um, but I did just want to say this this point about the number of trips. I, I just saw, saw a statistic that I think is compelling in London, which has a lot of new mobility of various kinds. The average number of trips that a Londoner takes in a day has fallen in the last four years from 2.5 trips per day to 2.1. And the story that, it, that, that pointed this out, the 15% drop, it's real. And the story says, well, th this is, you know, it's the Deliveroo Netflix effect. Deliveroo is like Grubhub. And, was, and, and, and they're really conflating two very different things there because you know, the idea of working from home or watching Netflix, and that means you're not taking a trip you otherwise would have taken. And, and by and large, in my mind, that's, that's good for the overall transportation network, that's fine. But the, the Deliveroo or Grubhub effect is a different story because then someone is in a vehicle delivering that, that, that thing that you ordered, whether it's a meal or something else. And that's what leads to this real concern of over usage of scarce street and sidewalk capacity. I include sidewalk because I do think these dr sidewalk drones are, they, they will come to Atlanta just like <laughs> they have to watch. Uh, or, or just to me, or or outright bans. I'm yeah. not sure that there's any reason why, why like sidewalks in my mind are for human beings, and I guess pets. Um, <laughs> we, like I always think of the dogs, but I'm not sure why we why these companies that are delivering your toothbrush on a sidewalk are entitled to use that space. One sec. I just want to. Uh, uh, it would be a really great thing if if, if uh, people asking questions would identify themselves. You don't have to because this is this is being uh, this being webcast. If so, if you feel a privacy issue, but it would be nice to know who you guys are because you guys are are you know this is Georgia Tech, and uh, you know you, you, we, we, it would be helpful. Areas that I've resonated well with was sharing. Okay? And one of the things that um, was from the fireside chat was taken. So, those two elements alone is if we are going to be able to collectively reap the benefits of an autonomous idea and concept, no matter how, how economically and all the other aspects. How can we break down the barriers of collectively sharing the data? Because there's a lot of discussions on who has ownership. Ah, you want me to? <laughs> <laughs> well, so so actually, it relates broadly to the idea that we right now. I don't think that there's a simple solution to a lot of the problems that we're discussing, unless we're actively collaborating. Uh, the idea of prohibitions of doing certain kind of things stops certain types of innovation. But the idea of doing it for free, like, well, okay, maybe that's not right either. Well, this idea that there's this shared space, even what are your personal privileges when you get directly to data? What are your privileges or your rights if you're choosing to walk on a city street? Uh, you know, it, do you have a right that no one should be able to take a photograph of you even though you've entered the public space? Those are discussions that, quite honestly, the, the tech industry and AV industry and broad tech, uh, we're only part of that conversation. We're trying to figure out how to navigate this responsibly. Uh, but that's, that's a much broader discussion. How to proceed, it requires dialogue like this to get together. It requires roll up your sleeves work behind the scenes when you're not in the public eye to do this. Uh, certainly something that, that uh, Argo is working on, our partner. Uh, first partner in OEM and Ford is actively working on it, trying to struggle with these because, and then we need to have some creativity, this idea of pilots, of trying different kinds of things, uh, because ultimately we're talking about social norms that could get radically or, or revolutionized. But if we're not trying some things, we're not really giving ourselves the power to experiment and learn and think about consequences that are, quite frankly, almost impossible to solve. The idea that you have gigabit internet to your home and that you could give up your car and get a bike and that you have a smartphone and all the stuff, back the clock up 25 years, I believe was the time scale you're projecting. 
Was that a prediction that most of us would have believed 25 years ago? And I would conjecture the answer would be no. Most of us wouldn't have understood most of it. So how do you project out 25 years in the future? Well, you start piloting, you start exploring, and you work together to try to find out what's possible. Uh, if you're not doing that, we're going to all stay in our silos. We'll all keep butting heads. Um, on the industry side and the startup, it's like you're like you got to you're looking for a way to survive and to thrive, but you've got all this. Uh, the idea of complete regulation that stops innovation, well, that would be bad outcome. Mm -hmm. Collaboration, pilots, that's, that's my view of how we get there. So um, I do a fair bit in the transit world in data sharing, open data, things like that. So I can tell you there are some lessons there that I think would help. One of them is standardization of data. Um, we've seen through the general transit feed specification that um, as we start to standardize these various data formats, then it makes it so that developers can come in and actually work on top of this and create newer tools and things like that. Um, not knowing as much about the technology side of the driverless um, vehicle world, I, I can't you know, talk to the idea of how that would be used, but I know one of the difficulties we had in transit was also worrying about the security implications of this, and I think in this situation, um, there's probably a lot of health scenarios we can imagine as well. Um, and that's actually what I was hoping that you would you would speak to a little bit is, um, you know, there's a lot of scenarios that are discussed. And I think as we talk about how do we share this data in a way that it can make all of these vehicles work better and that, you know, it's not just multiple vehicles sharing within the fleet that they're producing, but that, you know, multiple manufacturers are actually sharing this intelligence so that we can actually achieve the safety benefits we're hoping to get to. How do you do that in a way that you're not compromising security things and such? And I wish I knew the answer and I don't. I'd like to chime in. Um, shared mobility principle number eight is public benefits via open data and how you define that is beautifully broad and not specified in that principle that's so complicated and I would point you to sharedstreets.io that's doing good work. The reason we need that is if we want interconnectivity between modes, we have to have some standard open data. And if we want competition within modes, as in not monopolies only, we need some open data. So I think it's a really key part of this. Um, I would add one more piece to this that um, uh, when we think about do we need to keep piloting. I think we do need to keep piloting, but I want to point out that there are some things we know. We've spent a hundred years understanding what it looks like to move metal boxes on scarce streets. Mm -hmm. I don't need to have another, I don't care whether it's autonomous, owned by Lyft, owned by me, one driver, five people. We know what it looks like to have metal boxes on scarce streets. We don't need to, we don't need to imagine that. But we know that for sure. And if I come to data, there's things that we know that we don't like about data. We know that, that we want to have the user own their own data. We know that we want to know what's happening with our data. Mm -hmm. So all the issues around GDPR, we need to start applying. And what's interesting in this transition is to say overtly, right now in your own car, everyone owns their own. I do have this privacy expectation that you don't know my origin, my destination, my time match. And as we move people to shared, to shared modes, which is where we profoundly, mandatorily must go, we need to recognize there's this difference. So again, going to shared streets, and LA has been doing some stuff which I don't, I don't agree with um, because they are offering up my personal name attached to my trip. So is there a GDPR compliant MDS model? I think there is, and shared streets is working on that in Detroit, actually. Um, so you've got a great question, and there are people who are working on it, and we need to do more. Let me add one more dimension to the topic of data is so broad. There's questions about, well, what types of data? Is it the imagery? Is it the traffic flow? Is it the fact that Joe's Pizza actually is closed today? Uh, like there's so there's such a broad field that actually means a lot of different things and it gets into different dimensions. Part of, part of the healthy conversations like these, I think, that are going on are starting to break it down and to say, well, which problem are you trying to solve? What type of data or information is available? Uh, and then we can start being much more purposeful at actually, uh, you know, say, understanding traffic flows in a city at a, at a scale that we've never been able to do before. Got a question for our webinar audience. Um, 
No speeding, no improper lane changes, no DUIs, no reckless driving. Cities are going to go bankrupt. I mean, that seems like a, a simplified view of things, but is that a legitimate concern? Can I answer this again just quickly? Um, not only that, if we add in parking, how much money do they get from parking? And so, indeed, cities everywhere right now, and it's already right now they're experiencing it, as people are moving to using Uber and Lyft, and as we have more on-demand delivery, cities new, do need to start right now thinking about how can we price curb parking. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely, there's a huge amount of revenue that's going to be lost. The state of Massachusetts did a nice study on this. It's something like 60% of DOT's revenue. And if they have electric cars, and we continue to not address the gas tax versus where we want to go, um, so yeah, that, that's, not a, small thing. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> not a small thing. That's not a small. Yeah, things are not small yeah, things. but but I, yeah, I think everything that your uh, the participants in the webinar cited is pales in comparison to that last thing you just said, which is we have a gas tax that is so outdated in terms of actually funding our infrastructure needs here. I think you mentioned all the BMT mm -hmm. vehicle miles travel as as a powerful way of raising revenue. You know, and with my city official hat on. You know, I hear this critique. I think like. Uh, Sometimes there's like this this conspiracy undertone to questions like that, where there's this assumption, oh, you know, cities will never let this happen because they need the tread the ticket <laughs> revenue. That's just not true. It's not you know, it's not how cities operate. It's not how city leaders think. There's lots of ways of raising revenue and rethinking tax structures. That's a constructive conversation to have, and and frankly, that's where I think that researchers and think tanks can play a tremendously powerful role, laying out what an optimized revenue model would look like for cities around mobility. Yeah, I've, I've seen a couple, not very many, but a couple of different studies that have actually shown that when you look at, yes, there's a lot of lost revenue, but you also look at a lot of reduced expenditures. You don't need as many emergency staff. You don't need as many uh, police officers for just traffic violations. You don't need, you You can actually put, shift some of the those jobs to other jobs that actually have higher revenue for cities and actually sh so showing that cities are, could end up coming out the public municipal revenues actually being significantly higher um, after AVs. But it, it, no one really, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody truly knows yet. I agree with David, we need more and more. More research. More, more research. <laughs> We're Amen. Oh, we are. Yeah. <laughs> So, so to follow up on that, by not breaking laws and with a mixed fleet, you're going to have lanes blocked, that car will never move. Also, with these pilots we've been doing, it's been one company. And I've talked to many companies, I was like, how do you talk to another company, people, another company? So this is a DSRC, 4G, 5G. How is that getting put in there? Because if you go a Ford mode or Chrysler mode, you're going to drive nice and slow. But then you got the BMW mode where you're cutting through all the traffic. How are you going to standardize how you develop that? If someone's driving 55 miles an hour, if you were here, you saw the study by George Southern on 285, they blocked every lane of 285 and drove the speed limit, and it caused accidents. So if you get a line of a ton of speed limits going 45 in a 45 zone, people would normally drive 65, what does that look like? Yeah, I'll, I'll describe that as uh, as ugly. We're already, we're already seeing that every day uh, in, in different places. And that's part of the, the conversation we need to have. You know, in, in, in Pittsburgh, they just lowered certain speed limit uh, on a particular road from 35 miles an hour and people driving, uh, let's say, above 35 miles an hour. They lowered it to 25, but most of the drivers didn't seem to notice. The AVs did. All right. And and when we actually when we talk about AV safety, one of the challenges people want to say, well, cars got to stop and got to slow down. It's like, well, if you make the AV follow the posted speed limit, not the nominal traffic flow, you're actually increasing. Uh, you're creating a new safety hazard as you're experiencing there. The conversation, well, how do you control all the people? It's like, well, all right, that's what <laughs> we're trying to do from an AV side is to figure out what is the right way we can interact. Because we can't have our AVs getting ticketed all the time by riders who are like, I, I'm not doing the driving. So uh, so how do you resolve that, though? How do you change human behavior? Well, I think a lot of it, a lot of it, again, you, planners say you need to plan on a designer. It, it's a design problem. <laughs> um, so the, the way that streets are, we ought today, we, the design speed of a typical street, the civil engineer <laughs> transportation are sort of, 
the design speed and the posted speed often have nothing to do with each other. It's assumed that you have the wider lanes and you have courage, you know, to encourage people to drive actually more quickly often um, than in fact what is posted and safe. We know that today, if a, not today, but if a pedestrian is hit by a car going 22 miles an hour, chances are they live. And 23 miles an hour, chances are they don't. We should never have any vehicle going more than 20 miles an hour in, in areas that we want to be walkable and have a, some sort of vibe, some sort of quality of community street life sense of place. And when you, so it comes back to, a lot of it does come back to what is the kind that different communities want? And, you know, so that the opportunity that AVs give us, and frankly, we already have right now, um, but to really restripe those lanes, narrow the lanes, people drive, will drive more slowly. In places where there are places where we want cars to go fast on highways, there are places where we want them to go slowly. And that's going to take, I, I, most people will respond, humans will respond to the design cues, and then the AVs can respond to the, the actual posted. I just want to throw in um, some deep unfairness right now, the level playing field across modes for a multimodal future. Um, that includes fair user fees across all modes, fair space allocation across all modes, complete streets, and I would say fair enforcement across all modes. Mm -hmm. Why are we letting people drive 65 miles an hour when they should be going, whatever, 40? I mean, so, yeah, let's, let's stop them from doing that. We have policemen and traffic cameras to do that. Let me, let me jump in and talk about this one a little bit more too, um, as the civil engineer in the room. Uh, the thing that causes crashes is differentials. So it's when you've got different vehicles going drastically different speeds. That's why on the interstates in general, they can be very safe, even though we're going very, very high speeds. And so the problem that you're talking about is the fact that you've got this AV that's suddenly following the rules and other folks are not. But we can actually start to include some of these driverless vehicle technologies in vehicles today that would actually help to solve some of these problems. And this goes to some of the things that David was saying that, you know, we're, we're thinking too far in the future and not trying to apply these things that are necessary already now because we're losing sight of the problems before our eyes by focusing on things that are 50 years out. So. Why don't we already have speed regulation in vehicles? We know what the speed limit is on every inch of every roadway at this point. It would be very, very easy to make that mandatory in every vehicle on the roadway. And then we can achieve some of the safety benefits that AVs are promising way into the future, actually today. And so, you know, examples like what you're talking about in the interstate, they're actually following the rules. We're actually doing some work with simulation to look at what happens when we have a 10% AV fleet. How does them being really great rule followers actually change the interactions of what's happening with all the vehicles around? I mean, just listening, it's interesting, just the conversation last 40 minutes here, the ideas that are coming out, like things we should do, like like shifting away from the gas tax to BMT, having better urban design, more better speed enforcement. I totally agree about the differentials, being able to protect people who are going to be biking next yeah. to the cars going faster. None of this has anything to do with AV. <laughs> nothing. We can do it we now. Do, we should be doing it now. AVs, if it, it's you, AVs are useful. It's interesting when you get city officials or transit officials to talk, talk candidly. They generally will say, ah, AVs are way low on our priority list, but the clever ones recognize, ah, but this could be a useful tool to help me get the BRT line funded because then I can say AVs and buses can use this exclusively. Of course, AVs aren't going to be using it anytime really soon, but the buses, the BRT line for buses is hugely helpful. <laughs> Seriously, I literally had that conversation with a senior transit official a few weeks ago. So, uh, kind of piggybacking off of the data standards that standardization needs, we've been waiting for the feds to come with some sort of standardization for uh, TSRC, 4G, whatever communication mechanisms. There's some, but there's a lot of room for improvement. And Carrie, you mentioned GTFS fees, which came out of TriMet working with Google mm -hmm. to standardize what do we need. How can we, maybe Atlanta specifically, help move the needle for AV? 
or connected vehicles in the interim, um, developing what we need for, for open data of um, vehicle to vehicle technology for not just 20 years or 40 years from now, but in the interim as connected vehicles do hit our roads as GDOT invests in NTSRC deployments at a big large scale here. Um, does that question make sense? Can, can we format, can we be the model city for developing um, standardized communication uh, <laughs> protocols for vehicles to improve safety with certain yeah, I feel like everyone, including you, are looking at me, and and I don't know that much about the vehicle side in terms of you know understanding how we actually would do this. So I'm looking at other panelists to see if maybe. <laughs> um, so Benium is is doing mesh networking, and it's providing B to I, B to B, and B to wireless. And so when we think about this. For autonomous vehicles, right now it's an incredibly challenging problem. So they're holding network connectivity that works. They're saying, well, they do all the other spent on their stuff, but network connectivity, as you know, one thing doesn't fit all, and 5G is basically multiple modes. And so I think we do need to have multiple modes. I don't know if we think about the standards. So that's my question to you is are there standards that need to be developed, or do we say it needs to be a multi spectrum? piece because you're going to say what's available, what's the cheapest, fastest thing available, and it's going to be different in different places and different conditions. And I think that's what Benium is doing and, and others. But if your other questions seem to be what is the, what is the data, are there data standards? That, um, I don't know. We talked about this MDS, so GTFS was bus data, and I, and I look at that and I think, well, where transit has really lost out from TNCs is that and why transit authorities can't quite compete is they don't have the origin and the destination and the number of seats that are really compelling. If we had that data, as we start to introduce that into a robust GTFS or what it looks like for those TNCs and scooters and bikes right now, I'm wondering what, is, what are additional pieces that would be needed for this data standards for connected vehicles? I haven't yeah. thought about that. Uh, I'll add a piece. I, I wrote it long thing about integrated mobility in the capital region, Baltimore down to Richmond, including Washington earlier this year. And I think a big issue, like GTFS is great. It's, you know, it's a huge success, obviously, but there's no interoperability between uh, uh, around uh, ticketing. That's actually one I would really zero in on as a huge need mm -hmm. uh, across transit systems that can often be adjacent, like we have in the, in the Washington region. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, this is where there's been no movement, really, of integrating ticketing between transit agencies and TNCs mm -hmm. and the birds, the lines, so forth and so on. That So we're, we're pretty far away from, again, this, if you know the term mobility as a service, the idea with, behind that concept is that you can go on your smartphone and be able to book a trip that could be multimodal or just one mode uh, in, in one fell swoop. And that requires having integrated ticketing in some way on the back end of distributing the funds across the mode providers. We've not gotten anywhere there, and part of the problem, actually, is the, in my view, are the vendors behind the transit agencies that have shown no interest in opening up their, their ticketing systems. Uh, but this is, I think, an underappreciated and really important area where if we want to have an integrated mobility future, we need to solve the ticketing issue. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to, um, we're going to sign up on our webinar now. Uh, I think we can have this room for a couple minutes if we can, if we can continue. But I just want to thank all of you for coming uh, to the to uh, to this this hall and and the potentially millions of people out there who are watching our, our webinar. Uh, I want to I want to thank uh, the panelists uh, so much. Each each one of you really has contributed really greatly to this. I had very high expectations for this conversation, and it they have been vastly exceeded. Um, thank you all for asking such good questions. Uh, so we're going to sign off now.